The following podcast is brought to you by cdkoffers.com. Use offer code DIESHRING for 3% off everything on the website and Broken Silicon for 25% off all Windows codes. All right, on with the show. Welcome to Broken Silicon, a gaming hardware podcast. I am your host, Sub-Zero Tom, and I am joined by my co-host, Sleep Dan, as my entire town is currently getting covered in sleep, which is pretty cool right now. Yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is that usually I turn off my heating for a couple hours while I record a podcast, but that's just not happening this time, guys, I mean, it, it's like it's below zero as we're recording this, at least where I am, and Peoria Heights. And I have to have my faucets dripping to make sure pipes don't freeze or it doesn't matter if I have to or not. Anyone who's owned a house and had pipes freeze and then had to deal with what happens most of the time when your pipes freeze is just going to pay the extra five dollars that month on water to not have to even remotely risk dealing with that. But it's actually so cold that the water dripping in my bathtub shower, there's a small section of ice on the bottom of the Jesus. bathtub. Didn't you have a pipe freeze up already? Uh, or did you? No. I you just needed it. to do laundry But you could tell that it for... almost did. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you've had to deal with that before because some of the piping in your house isn't the best. So. I know it's you've had pipes freeze over like two or three times now, which uh, is not in the past two cool. years. I've learned my yeah. lesson twice now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which so not is three times, two times. Two times. <laughs> <laughs> and whenever I'm staying at your house, you always make sure if it's in the winter, you say, "Dan, leave the pipes dripping. I'm not dealing with this again." <laughs> and I make my my uh, I will kill you face while I say it usually. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Which I also just made at you a second ago because you swore in the first minute of recording and we had to start over, Dan. Come on. I'm sorry. I forgot. It, I won't do it again, man. Yeah. Well, and yeah, I'm looking at, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's almost like negative 10 Fahrenheit where I am now. It, it's absolutely ridiculous. So if you hear, if you hear a little bit of burning in the background, that's because the heat's on. Although to be honest, I doubt you'll hear it. But yeah, that, that that's what we're dealing with here. I mean, it's. It's a good time to mine, I guess. I don't. <laughs> we'll get, although, although not for most people, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. That that's a story we'll get to. Um, I don't know. I, let, let's get to the the initial reader mails here to warm up. Greeny writes in just like you guys can if you support us on Patreon and says, "I just got a new place and I will be moving in soon. What's the most efficient console PC components I can use to heat up my room without having to turn on the heater?" Well. I think you've got to define uh, what you mean by efficient. But if you mean efficient in terms of turning out heat, I, I remember this benchmark. I think, God, I want to say it was done by Tom's Hardware with original Kepler Titans or something. And they put like three of them in SLI and they wanted to, they literally benchmarked heat output per watt compared to. To a, um, what do I want to say? Com compared to a space heater, and they found that it was almost exactly the same. Maybe actually slightly more efficient at putting out heat per energy consumed. Now that was all the way back with, I think, if I remember correctly, right, twenty-eight nanometer chips, like seven years ago, or maybe eight years ago. So I don't know if the smaller the node, the more efficient it is at turning watts into heat. But I don't think it matters that much. To be honest, I would guess that the difference in efficiency for watt per heat is the difference in efficiency in the power supply in the space heater compared to his PC. Oh, yeah, probably. As I, I doubt they're using it's very like efficient a five, power supplies. It's like a 5% difference. <laughs> for those uh, space heaters. But yeah, I don't know, man. Just turn on a, a power-hungry benchmark and get, I don't know, get some 3090s and pump out heat. Yeah, well, I mean... Careful when you say 3090s. I think it's pretty limited how many you could even put on one power supply. That's very but, true. 
Maybe three, of course, if you had like a 1500 watt. Uh, I don't know. Well, you could probably... I, actually, I wouldn't recommend it with 1200 watts. You could probably get away with it, but I would recommend like 1500 watts if you had three 390s, actually. Do they even... Oh, yeah, they do make like a couple power supplies that strong, so... Well, yeah, and if you're in Europe, you can get it up to, I think, 2000 watts. Well, yeah. Mm. Yeah, oh, they yeah. go... And there are actually expensive server power supplies, I think even in the U.S., that go crazy high if you wanted to go bonkers. But yeah, so I think the honestly, just turn it on and turn it on the most power usage, you, you know, the most intensive thing you can. And that's it. That's really all there is to it. It will just convert, you know, the like it, it whatever board power it is, that's how much heat pretty much it's going to put out. Yeah, so it, it just matters that you're putting some heat out to space heat your room. All right. Uh, Viking R writes in and says, you should do a drunk history, but drunk tech related history. I mean, honestly, all you got to do is find some of my earlier live streams. And I think over time, the, the, you know, I'm sure one or two of those, I, I get a little drunk by the end. So I, I know a couple of them, people were just a, a couple of them early on. People were just like paying you to drink another beer, and you're like, "Guys, this is like my fifth beer now on the stream. This this is the last one I'm it's going done to do." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, which I mean, yeah. Remember when on the live streams, you can tip us. To, well, you can tip us to drink a beer no matter when. You ju- you know, just just we we have our accounts listed in the description. There's multiple ways to um, just just say this is for a beer, and then I'll have to drink one. Yeah, it doesn't need to be during a live stream. I'm very much an equal opportunity employer when it comes to people paying me to drink. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so I just, don't have a problem. Just so, so just know, if you tip Tom to drink a beer, he'll do it. You won't. I mean, you won't see him drink the beer or anything. But just know in your heart, he is drinking a beer. Mm-hmm. All right, now let us move on to corrections and emissions. TSPCFS writes in and says, Tom, in the latest Die Shrink episode 39, to be specific, you mentioned Samsung GDR6. What kind of advantages does GDR6 bring over GDDR6? Is it like GDR5X, except it loses a letter instead of gaining a letter? Well, no. So GDR6 is uh, is a variant of GDDR6 that is quicker yeah. to say. <laughs> yeah, and I think I'm not sure sh- have I brought this up on the podcast before or have I just brought it up while talking to you? I I brought up I don't think we ever say the second D in GDDR6 and I don't think anyone does. I and and I, you mentioned that to me and I pulled up a previous episode just randomly and found a section where we talk about you know some kind of GDDR and I was like, oh yeah, I just was saying GDR6 the whole time, and no one's been correcting me for years. I don't think, I think most people skip it. I swear to God, the second D is just hard to say, man. Yeah. I mean, let's just be honest. Not everyone can take two Ds. <laughs> no, most people can. <laughs> Mia writes in and says, in Die Shrink 39, Tom is quoted as saying, Mia writes in and he says, I get that the vast majority of your audience is male, but bruh, come on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it is just a habit. If I haven't met someone, I just, especially if it's related to some gaming thing, I, I tend to say he. Although, I, yeah, I don't know. I got it wrong. What can I say? You know, what can, what can we say? I, I will say, though, when we play like Call of Duty Warzone, if they're character avatar is female we tend to say she yeah so just know if you're a guy and you're playing call of duty we're referring to you as female if you have a female avatar in metal gear online 2 i had a female character as my lead character and everyone just referred to me as she and jen because that was in the name (laughs) i was just like whatever i'm jen now you've you've become jen what does it really matter it doesn't but I apologize, Mia. That is a female name, and I will hopefully not do that again. Although I can't even say Ram correctly, so like it's kind of a big ask. It's just slow down. We're going to accidentally do it. I mean, yeah, like you said, we can't say Ram names correctly. We're all over the place. I mean, we're just going to call somebody a he every once in a while, man. Maybe I should call the next person she just to balance it out. Ooh, that's, that's a good idea. It's probably not. Voodoo writes in, and I believe he says this, 
right in here. So my opinion is read about in a future show. I can't see a better place to do it, but the corrections and omissions section for the main podcast. I just want to say that I do think it's smart to mi- it's not smart to make an unedited video show as you have been speculating on doing recently. A video show will either need awkward visual cuts, be very costly, or will lower the value of the podcast in one or more ways. For example, visuals that can't be seen for audio patrons or extended dead mic time, these things are not good, and people's free time will be dramatically reduced soon after COVID. Don't make a short-sighted production decision that bites you in a year. We should have said bites you in a rear in a year. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, this is something we've talked about for, I mean, I mean, what do you think, Dan? Let's just, you know, uh, what do you think about turning this into a more video centric show? I'm still not sure how I feel about turning it into a video centric show. I, I don't dislike the idea of reformatting the show. So it's a more general, consistent format every, every week where it's uh, I'm on weekly, except it's like, I don't know, somewhere between half to a third the show, depending on the conversation you have that week. I think that's a good idea. For One, the news section. Yeah, I think having a consistent, shorter weekly news section, one, might might make more sense as an end product, and two, honestly, just from a production standpoint, is I think is easier for me than doing these extended two-hour, I mean, these extended... Uh, Bi-weekly or is it yeah. semi-weekly podcasts? See, bi-weekly because, can mean two things. It can technically mean twice a week or it can mean every other week. That's so, why I don't say it. Yeah, to so, those people who suggested, by the way, in our earlier debate that I should be saying bi-weekly instead of every other week, some people interpret that to mean twice a week. Yeah, so I'll just say uh, every other week. I uh, At a certain point, it's getting a little hard for me to carve out the time on a two-weekly basis to be able to... Ju- just to be able to record the podcast, but like a shorter, like 45 minute to hour long time block is a lot easier to do weekly. Yeah. Well, and from my perspective, it almost something probably needs to change to have one consistent long-term piece of content every week, just because of how the channels evolved, right? Like I think I mean, since almost since the start of Moore's Law is Dead, Broken Silicon has been the main piece of content. Like sometimes there's two videos a week. Sometimes there isn't a video a week. Sometimes there's a live stream is the video a week. But there's always a Broken Silicon every week. There always has been. We know we we make sure that's always out there. So we cover the news and bring in new voices. But that was then. And we were really punished by YouTube's algorithm over December when we almost entirely just put out podcasts for a few weeks. And so I'm going to be honest, guys, it's almost just a natural reality that for how content is advertised by YouTube on YouTube, that we need to find something a bit more consistent long term, uh, unless something changes and we'll see, right? Yeah. uh, Well, and the problem with the algorithm and like people that follow YouTubers, I mean, I've been following YouTubers for years now and yeah, there's the consistent thing about YouTube is that YouTubers are constantly trying to figure out how to game, not game the algorithm, how to work with the algorithm. But YouTube constantly seems to be updating it. So it's always confusing for people what what they're doing that's uh, causing them to be punished by it. You would think that if someone subscribed to your channel, that YouTube would simply suggest every piece of content to that person consistently if they like it. But that's just not how it works, unfortunately. Yeah, like they even have a subscription tab that just shows you a chronological order of your subscriptions. And I believe, I don't think they ended up going through with it, but they almost started curating that too. (laughs) I think they did briefly and people were like, God, can you just stop? Yeah, like... the. This was the one piece that you don't curate for us. Can we please just have this still? Yeah. So uh, some of it's just the natural realities of trying to make sure we bring in, frankly, I mean, I mean, let's just be honest to all of you here, enough revenue to keep this sustainable. You know, this is a full-time job for me. I don't have other income and I'm also paying Dan and an audio engineer and I'm you know, getting exhausted, right? I run, I needed someone to manage the website soon as well. And we definitely need some sort of notes 
organizer kind of and Discord manager type person. And we can't afford to do that if YouTube's just going to nerf our suggestions. If it just, I don't know, because it decides to, (laughs) you know. So that's part of it. And it also is just kind of a reality that if we don't get a ton more assistance, that it's the only way I can think of to sustainably keep the content everyone likes consistent as well. Like it's, it is so much like how exhausted were we last time we did a news episode when we did that after I put out a video in the middle of the night. I mean, we were, and and with the dye shrink as well, we were dead. Yeah. I mean, I I've accepted at least that this, this, uh, uh, next few months, I'm just going to be tired all the time, (laughs) but (laughs) that's just life circumstances. But so I guess that's just what I'm saying, you know, guys, is like, well, we have to find a way to make this sustainable. You know, we, we've had a lot of attrition. We're gaining patrons, but we're still not to the goal where I feel this is a reliably sustainable business. And then I'm about to add, it might even be, I'm hopefully going to have the next goal and plans for the channel on the patron page as well by the time this goes live, at least in the public feed. So we'll see. But, you know, so, I mean, I guess that's what I'm saying, though, is if you don't like that, you know, I mean, you know, we're listening to you. And what I can do, though, is promise you, I'm never going to make broken silicon turn into something where you have to use YouTube to get the most out of it. Because that's actually a gigantic pet peeve of mine is people that call their shows a podcast. And then half of it just wastes your time with dead air and, oh, oh, I forgot to Google this. And if you're not being distracted by the dancing lights on a screen. It's just insufferable. And I think the best use of long form content is that you can consume it while being productive doing other things. And I will, I'll never let broken silicon lose that. So whatever we do, I will make sure that it's not required in the video version really to even see it. And that the RSS feed versions are edited a bit more, just like how they are now, by Gerard, our audio engineer, to make sure it is even more, shall we say, audio-only centric in the RSS feed versions. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to throw it out there. If even 10%, 10% of our weekly listeners and viewers were to subscribe to the Patreon, we would be able to afford to do everything you want at once without any worries about anything. Right? Yeah. Yeah. With a massive increase to production value in all forms, video and podcast. So just if you're listening, we do need support. And there's just a mountain of like, I honestly, like if you listen to multiple pieces of our content every week, there's a certain part of me that just goes, I don't know what you're doing anymore. Like for $2 a month, you get like 100 exclusive pieces of content, reader mail for the guests, you know, so you get, you know, die shrink every other week. There's so much content there for like, 50 cents a, like a week, less than that, technically. <laughs> like, so if you are listening to this, just keep in mind that the only way this happens is if we get more support. Otherwise, we'll just have to start looking for new forms of content because we'll assume this just isn't a sustainable business anymore. Yeah. Which, if you'll notice, has happened to how many tech tubers in the past year? Oh, yeah. That, I mean, that's just the nature of this is there's a relatively high turnover of people on YouTube in general. Yeah. I mean, this only lasts if you guys wanted to. So, but let us g- continue. Crast, let me see. I make sure I didn't skip one. Yeah. Crast writes in and says, Tom, on the January live stream, I have a correction. You said, well, you can't get a GPU, but thankfully you can still get GPUs and laptops. Might be the way to game right now if you're itching to get a 30 series. I thought I said, hopefully. I don't know if I said I was sure about that. But then he points out, well, now miners are buying laptops, so we're screwed, which. You know what, Crast? That brings us to story number one. Chinese miners using RTX 30 series laptops for mining power. And I quote from Tom's Hardware, over the past week, Ethereum has skyrocketed to nearly $1,700 in value at the time of this writing. I think it's a little higher than that now, or it's around there. And he and he continues, making Ethereum very profitable to mine once again. But due to the shortage in graphics card supplies right now, desperate Chinese miners are apparently turning to RTX 30 series laptops as a new way to mine the cryptocurrency as shown in a series of images that depict a laptop mining farm. And another demonstration of how valuable Ethereum has become a vlogger posted on Bilibili, which is, I believe, just Chinese YouTube, that she went to a local Starbucks in China with an RTX 3060 laptop and showcased uh, her 
getting a payout from Ethereum for just two hours. She claims the 3060 Mobile Edition uh, with its memory overclock gave 46 mega hash, which is about a Vega 64, mm-hmm. by the way. Uh, and after, although probably using about as much as the underclock, the underclocked Vega 64 would use like 140 watts, though. So it is probably still more efficient. After two hours, she claims she made 90 cents. That might not like sound like much, but she claims she was able to pay for her coffee with what the laptop was mining while she was there. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to be honest, though. I, I have a ton of problems. I actually brought this up. I don't want to spend too much time, but I think, I think we have to because people are talking about it and it affects gaming hardware. 90 cents for two hours, and it's only because she was getting free energy in a country with notoriously cheap energy at a Starbucks. It's I, that's that's your example of profitability. It, it's not that impressive. Yeah, for like, like what a fourteen hundred dollar laptop. Yeah, I I don't know how many mining firms are doing this. I, I'm curious, like how big of a, a firm that is buying up a bunch of thirty sixty laptops to do mining. I, I wonder if it's because it seems like a relatively short sighted decision to me. They're Way more expensive than graphics cards. I don't think they're really going to make a profit off of this. Maybe I'm wrong, but I really don't see how they're going to make a profit. And that's what I have to say is I think people see this and they go, oh, well, this is happening. And of course, they wrote it. Of course, this view, this YouTuber wrote it in a, or I guess, Billy 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 Uber wrote this in a way that, of course, makes it sound like it was a good idea because that's her job to make her video, make her look good. So you subscribe and whatever. But I I just, for so what? She made, I I actually doubt that she actually made that much, by the way. I doubt it. (laughs) Um, I don't, I'm just saying it. I don't believe her. Um, And so her business model is she has to leave her laptop in a Starbucks for free energy. And then what? And then she'll make what is that four less than four dollars a day off of it? That's yeah, not impressive. <laughs> no, it, you know, so maybe you'll pay it off in a year if you hide it in a Starbucks for an entire year if it lasts that long. Because laptops are not meant to be run twenty four seven. Yeah, and plus they're way more expensive for the component because you can rig several uh, graphics cards to one CPU. For this model to work, you need to have a new system for every graphics card. Uh, which makes it way, way less profitable inherently. And, and keep in mind, it's wasting energy running the whole laptop, whereas a mining rig is only running usually like a 20-watt CPU and one motherboard for like six graphics cards. Yeah, so if you want to pr- uh, be probably less energy efficient if we're looking at the entire system, I mean, maybe not, I guess, uh, spend $1,700 on a laptop and have a... And have a PC that will fail more quickly. I guess you can mine with make a laptop mining farm. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that's why I brought this article up just to like point out how absurd some of the things people are saying are. But also to just, I, I also want to bring up a couple of other things. So like I've had, I, I'm not saying it's entirely stupid to have your gaming desktop mine while you're not gaming. I do that. I've done that since. 2000, late 2013, I think. Like, I've been doing that for like eight years. So I'm not against this at all. This idea that if you have a high end graphic card, let's just be honest. What I mean, like, we're talking about like Ampere cards that can have over 30 teraflops. You're really using that just for gaming? I mean, there is an argument to be made that it's kind of inevitable that if graphics cards get this powerful in general use, and for general use, that they're just going to be hard to get for not just mining, but folding at home, rendering farms, everything, right? So that's that. some of that's unavoidable, but this isn't the same as that. And I'm worried people see this and say, well, I got to buy 10 more, and they fail to understand how much more work is required. Like, I have very cheap energy where I live. And I just did the math on what a 3060 laptop would do here. It it would basically pay for itself in a year. If it was doing it 24-7 for one year and Ethereum still existed, I mean, we've just seen Ripple, which isn't a mining coin, but that's now under investigation by the SEC. And I'm going to be honest, I think they're going to lose and that's going to be it, the end of Ripple. You know? Yeah. And how many coins have I seen just 
collapse from either an exploit. You know, like you're but you're assuming not only that you can you're assuming not only that you can have this mine for an entire year, but that the coin will even still exist for that long. Which, which in Ethereum has some very big sustainability problems when it comes to how bloated its blockchain is becoming. I think it's oh, it's multiple terabytes now. I'm not going to look it up. But whereas Bit, I don't want to get into it. But let's just say there are some very very real problems with scaling. And in fact, this year they're transitioning to proof of stake. So these calculations you're doing will not be there forever. They're 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 removing proof of work, which is what mining with a graphics card is. They're removing it, guys. You can't rely on it. And even assuming that you can rely on some extent of proof of work, I don't remember how much they're transitioning to proof of stake on Ethereum, but I just don't feel like Ethereum is here forever. And I don't, I'm not going to say it's going to collapse in a month, but I'm, Ethereum is no. going to collapse eventually. I, I can't tell you when, hot but it's take going from to. from Dan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's a hot take from your perspective, but I don't know, maybe it is out outside of us. It's it's not going to be here forever. Which we just kind of have to stop now because we could do an entire podcast talking yeah. about the sustainability and differences between how the blockchains run for different cryptocurrencies, which we're not going to. But yeah. I think that's worth mentioning that whether it collapses or not, they're transitioning to proof of stake. So like all this math you're doing saying it's going to pay for itself in a year. Again, if you have a gaming PC and you're not gaming, might as well let it make whatever amount of money, you know, for free especially during the winter months when it's heating your house. Absolutely. That makes so much sense. But don't go out and buy up a bunch of laptops thinking with the with the assumption that for sure you're going to make a bunch of profit. This isn't a get rich quick scheme and when I look at the profitability of this, this is still like a third of what it was in 2017-2018, guys. I'm not kidding. We're not going to see a mining boom like 2017-2018 and I think people are deluding themselves and I think this is going to get as big as that one was. Yeah, and I think I pointed this out in the recent die shrink that patrons, of course, would be able to listen to last week, where the analogy I made is this. It's very comparable, I feel like, this mining boom to the gold rush in California. The first gold rush, which if we're going to use this analogy with mining booms, would have been like 2013, 2014 for Litecoin, Dash, you know, so on and so forth. The first gold rush in California, no, they weren't idiots. They made a lot of money. Seriously. San Francisco was built by miners that showed up and just stumbled into tons of gold for like months straight, right? Like yeah. I think you've, you've told me some crazy examples about like people had so much money that there was de facto inflation because people were just willing to pay 10 times as much as usual for bread. Well, no, that was because um, they ran out of eggs and they couldn't get any chickens to the the... San Francisco. So instead they got wild eggs from like this weird island. <laughs> and oh. that's why it was so expensive. It was really expensive to get those wild eggs. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. But yeah, so those people made out like bandits. There really are a lot of families that were established by the first gold rush in San Francisco. And then the second one, to my knowledge, and I did study this a bit in college. Uh, the second one, a lot of people broke even. You weren't an, uh, an idiot. A lot of people did. You know, and and that would be comparable to the 2017 one. You know, it, it, but you know what? You didn't make as much money because it was also kind of less risky. The first people who did the gold rush, the city wasn't even there yet. <laughs> yeah. And Whereas then, the second one, the city was there. People would sell you pickaxes, but that's what they were doing now, mostly selling the pickaxes, not mining. And then the third one, no one made any money late 1800s really with those gold rushes. I'm sure some did, but it was it. Most rare. people lost. Yeah. I mean, and you you have to wonder, why is the guy that was just mining gold, why is he selling pickaxes now? <laughs> um, so I don't know. It, it's it's not uh, yeah. it's not going to last forever. I think I, I just think a lot of people are going to end up wasting their money uh, attempting to chase uh, a previous mining boom because it, it, they missed the other one. Yeah, it, it's just over. And sometimes you have to accept that you missed. You miss something and there's no way to go back in time and correct that error. Yeah. And and the final thing I will say is there's a lot of costs. There is a massive difference in effort between mining at a small, at a like completely amateurish level and mining at a semi-amateurish and then mining at a grand scale. If I'm being entirely honest, mining, in my opinion, mostly just makes sense for the people that literally just 
happen to have a mining card and it's mining in its off hours. And then it makes sense for massive firms that can afford to hire someone whose entire job eight hours a day is walking around and making sure all the racks are working. Mm -hmm. Those are the two tiers where it makes sense. But once you start scaling up, and this is something I had to deal with, and I had you know dozens of cards, multiple rigs. The difference between having one or two hobbyist rigs and having three and four is substantial. Like if you have one rig, it might go down. If you, especially if you're new to it and you have a tendency to overclock it too much or make silly mistakes, it, it might go down once a week. But it's like who cares? I'll just turn it on when I wake up. But once you start investing thousands of dollars into having five rigs, one's going down every day and the troubleshooting can add up. It turns into a full-time job by the time you get to multiple rigs usually. And you'd be surprised how much that heat adds up. Like I swore I would never do that to myself again after I mined through the entire 2018 summer. It was like 90 degrees in my house. Like yeah. For, it, was, it was a nightmare. And so that's all I'm saying is, and I've had people on the Discord reach out to me and say, you are right, it's already getting untenable in Texas to keep these things cool. Like, I can't afford it. It's just, it only makes sense if you have dirt cheap energy and I have 0. 0.06 kilowatt hours. You know, it's like half cents. the rate of the country, I think. So yeah. uh, The average rate of the country. You know, most, a lot of China has below 5 cents, you know, so that makes sense. And there are some places where it's like 5 cents. You know, that's about where it makes some sense. Uh, and if you're, I would say if you're below eight cents, it makes sense to just leave your PC on. But once you start trying to scale up, I'm just warning you, you might underestimate what if a power supply breaks? What happens then? Did it fry one of your cards? Well, now you got to get that repaired. You're probably just going to want to order a new power supply on Amazon to make sure there's no downtime because every day your rig's down, <laughs> it's not making money. And every day more people are hooking up more cards and the difficulty is going up. Every successive day of mining, typically the Ethereum per day you get goes down. It only goes up in profitability if the price skyrockets. But then what happens if you didn't sell before it went back down? There's just a lot to consider. And I, I just, I didn't want to spend too much time, but I think we spent a lot of on this. But this is a major point and it's it, you know? I think it makes sense if you have it as a hobbyist, but don't underestimate how many things can go wrong, how how temporary this can be, and how many things you might, and how much time it might actually take to manage multiple rigs. Yeah, and to go back to the final, the initial story, I'm, I hope this doesn't affect availability of laptops that much. I doubt it will because, frankly, I think it's a kind of stupid idea to rig up a hundred laptops for your mining farm, and I doubt many people are going to think that. I I bet a lot of people would agree with me. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm doubting this is super widespread, right? I, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Daniel Vega Hyde writes in and says, in Broken Silicon 86, you discuss a reader mail about having graphics cards on M.2, uh, on M. over M.2 so that you could upgrade. There was a standard for removable graphics cards for laptops called MXM, just so you know. It never really caught on, though, and it seems to have been phased out. I think the main issue would be that if you upgrade the GPU, you may not have the correct cooling for the new GPU. Well, there was that, and also it was like never 100% that your new graphics card would even work. Like You would often try to find a Dell graphics card to put in to upgrade your Dell laptop because sometimes it just wouldn't be compatible with the BIOS of an HP laptop. Mm -hmm. And additionally, like it usually didn't work out to be a good deal. Sometimes, yes, people were selling used MX7 graphics cards on eBay for a reasonable price, but that market's super niche. So usually it was not a good deal and you would have just been better off buying a new laptop practically. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh Upgrading your laptop graphics card thing, it's just a super niche pro idea. And I don't know. I think that's going to make it always expensive. And like we said with that answer about M.2, it's a pretty niche. It's very niche, so it probably will never really come to fruition, even if it would be possible on like super low uh, power GPUs. Yeah. I mean, the only reason... And so we we knew about this, but we really talked about the M.2 idea a lot just because, well, maybe because it's a more open standard that you can easily access, maybe it would be better. Of course, it's limited to like 10 watts or something. So we also were like, well, 
It would need to be at least limited, I think, to 30 watts to make any sense. Yeah. But if it was, it's usually easier to access than the MXM, you know, like, it, like, cause then you have, cause that was the whole problem, right? With the MXM standard is, is the cooling solution really going to fit on it anyways? And, you know, whereas if it was a self-contained cooling system in a thicker M.2 slot bay, there, there's some, I think, conjecture that maybe it could almost work much easier to upgrade, right? But obviously it has its own problems and it's not a thing. I, I think you could figure out some solution to make uh, a cooler that would work using that M.2 uh, at, at low power, like 30 watts, but I don't know. <laughs> there it is. Take a sip. Dan said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We do say, I don't know, a lot, just kind of as a pause. Deal with it. All right, story number two, 8 gigabyte RX 6800 listed. Real or not, does this make any sense? And that's just the title I put myself. It it showed up on a boutique PC builder website, I think, for pre-order. I mean, I don't have much to say besides stating that. A boutique builder listed a 8 gigabyte RX 6800 for pre-order. And I have problems with it really making sense. I mean, AMD is having trouble meeting demand with these graphics cards. And the bottleneck by a large margin is the silicon dies, yeah. not the GDR6 chips, although those are also silicon. So I, I don't know why you would make a cheaper 8 gigabyte version that what? So, so the MSRP, as fake as it feels right now, is 580. So what are they going to make this 5? 50, but there'll be less profit. They would be better to just keep trying to sell the most premium versions with more RAM. They'd be um, better to make a 32 gigabyte version. Unless this is some OEM card, which I don't know. This website which it, maybe. It this website seems similar to it's not it's not like origin or what's the name of those custom BC building websites? Like I buy power. I don't or I I I think it's better yeah, than exotic that. PC and but, there's a bunch of others. But I, I I feel like the way these work is they're just they buy a bunch of cards and then they build your custom rig for you. So I don't think this would be some weird OEM deal they have with AMD. I will say it's weird that they haven't corrected it yet if it's not correct if this isn't real though, because I did look at it today and it's still up. It it's says still eight gigabyt. It says eight gigs, yeah. So Which I was talking to Carbon Cry about it on Twitter, and of course he brought up the bottleneck uh point and I was like I agree, but I've seen dumber things release. I mean, I think there was technically a four gigabyte 390. Real? Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, but it's right like China it. only or something. So that's what I would assume. I, I really doubt, even if this is real, though, this will be widespread and go for sale on Newegg. I just don't see the point in it, especially as I continue to hear rumors that the 6700 XT is pretty powerful so what would be the point like where do you price this i don't see well, what, why and what what would you even price it at where it would make sense because the bulk yeah. of, the bulk of the price isn't that 8 gigs of gdr6 and that's going to diminish the value of it significantly so what do you price it at 450 or something and like barely make any money on it or <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't so know. So I guess that's all I'm saying is this doesn't make any sense in my opinion for AMD to launch this widespread but hey dumber things have happened <laughs> way dumber <laughs> Story number three, AMD Radeon RX 6700 XT 12 gigabyte and Radeon RX 6700 6 gigabyte custom graphics card spotted from PowerColor, quoting from WCCF Tech. PowerColor is the latest manufacturer to submit their upcoming AMD Radeon 6700 XT and 6700 custom graphics cards over at EEC. Previously, both Gigabyte and ASRock had submitted the Radeon 6700 series graphics cards at the Eurasium Economic Commission, confirming the 12 gigabyte 6700 XT and the 6 gigabyte memory capacity for both cards. So, yeah, I didn't see I didn't look too much into a 12 gigabyte version of the 6700 XT, but I do find the 6 gigabyte 6700 interesting because that was always highly speculated like what are they going to do? You know, I know I, I knew a professional prototype had 10 gigabytes, you know, so cut down to what was so 160 bit or something and that they were considering 6 gigabytes or 12 as well. It sounds like they may and I, and I did reach out to a source about this. Uh, He indicated, yeah, it really does seem like they will have six gigabytes, 6,700. So for now, I I look at this and I say, most likely. 
Yeah, and I, uh, I don't know what to add. Wait, wait, not to cut you off, but that yeah. it is worth pointing out, though, that I do need to say it's still not confirmed just because how many rumors were there from gigabyte submissions, for example, of like 30, 70, 16 gigabytes, guys. <laughs> just yeah. because it's right submitted does not mean it will come out. But 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 from what I've you know gathered from one source, it sounds like it really might be. Sorry, go on. But no, I was just going to say, I, you would hope for something in 2021 that's got probably going to be $300, maybe even more. You would hope it would have eight plus gigabytes, but I guess there's six. I, I don't know. I don't know how much else to add to that other than, yeah, I don't like seeing six gigabytes. But I would assume they'll have both six and 12 gigabyte options, right? Yeah, probably. But I guess what I would say is this kind of, and, and actually I'll say this too, I also heard that it's likely they will just launch the 6700 XT for a while and that the other one may follow a whole month later or something. So who knows how, what volume the six gigabyte will actually be, by the way, right? It, like when it yeah. first come, when it's first like benchmarked, it may basically just exist in name only. I would, I would wonder. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I think the 60, I think 12 gigabytes would be, well, I, actually, I don't know. This six gigabyte, if they sell that for like 280 or something, would probably sell really well. So, <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's what I find so interesting. I was talking to a couple of sources about this, just like, well, you know, there's no such thing as a dumb product, there's only dumb prices. They sold the 5600 XT successfully for like 280 or 290, whatever, right? And at that price, you know, okay, so this, as far as I hear, the 6700 non XT should be a little bit better than the 5700 XT. If they price that at 300, it's like, well, it's less than the 5700 cost because it has less memory, but it's also like 25% stronger or something. So, you, yeah, 300 bucks, you know, and if they bookend it that way, $300 for 6700 six gigabytes, $400 for 6700 XT, four, you know, that kind of finishes up the lineup. Then they have a $300 card, a $400 card, $600 and $700 cards. Yeah, the only thing they're missing is an actual low price card, but those don't exist anymore. (laughs) So, (laughs) I mean, you have to wonder, right? Even on the professional roadmap, it sounded like um, Navi 22 was always going to be quarter, late quarter one or early quarter two, although they were thinking of launching it sooner until demand made them go, <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> and and Navi 23 was always rumored to launch during the summer, but I have to wonder what the point of launching that even is. Like, why? Yeah, I guess you're right. I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I, I don't know if there's space in the market for that, for like a 60... 600 or 6500 at, at this point. I think there's still something for like a 6 Eventually there will but, be, but not while demands like this, especially yeah. with my understanding that it's like two thirds or more the die size of Navi 22. So it's like, just make Navi 22. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all right, let us move on to story number four. AMD Fidelity FX Super Resolution and Enhanced Radeon Boost coming in Spring Adrenaline update according to rumors. This one comes from HardwareTimes.com. And I quote, It looks like Team Red is working on another major update to Radeon software slated to land this spring. One of the primary additions will be the inclusion of the DLSS alternative, otherwise known as Fidelity FX Super Resolution, which will leverage the direct ML API to upscale the image with a minimal loss in quality. Unlike NVIDIA's implementation, this is a software-based technique that only requires the presence of Microsoft's Direct ML API to work. The enhanced version of Radeon Boost improves the image quality and static scenes by leveraging the new RB Plus engine and utilizing VRS, variable rate shading, to distinguish between the parts of the frame which are stationary and excluding them from the algorithm. So... Yeah, what's interesting is what he's listing is what I've been speculating. Uh, I'd say informed speculating based on hints from a couple sources for months, if you'll remember, mm-hmm. Dan. Haven't I been... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That's what I've been saying, right? It's a combination of of sharpening, uh, upscaling, and variable rate shading. Which, Hal, up to this point, is DLSS been any different than that for the most part? <laughs> They have to have an answer to DLSS at some point. I'm, I'm actually surprised it took them this long to do it, given that 
the LSS has been around for what, like two years now, almost? Well, I would argue it's really only existed for like one year. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, when it launched, it was garbage. It was utter hot garbage. It didn't even work. And half the games I've tested with, it still don't work. And in a way, that's better than just honestly turning down the resolution scale and turning on TAA. Like, yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's almost a non-product. Two point. It, the I'd new, say it works well in Minecraft. The new one is um, two point one, right? Uh, I think that's coming out. I don't know. I, I don't keep track. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, I, I honestly don't see it as that much of a real feature yet. But I see it as something AMD needs to answer very soon because it's almost a real thing that it's not. The, it's not in every game, you know. But it will be in a lot of them by the end of this year. And if AMD doesn't have anything, it's like what is going on. Yeah, and even if it's lowering the qual- visual quality, the performance uptick you get in some games is pretty crazy for DLSS, like on um, like Death Stranding. Uh, the performance uptick was massive on, on yeah. that. So, yeah, like that or Minecraft, RTX works pretty well with it. Uh, the one thing I have to say, though, is that, again, I ran this rumor as well past a source and I was told that this could be entirely fake. (laughs) So I'd be careful buying into this prematurely. And at the very least, I was told that if this is real, it's super early and you should not expect it in spring. He said he'd be very surprised if it actually got there by then. Take it with a grain of salt, I guess. Yeah, I'm not disproving this. You, can, you know, it's not like t- Moore's laws d- disproves hardware times. That's not what I'm saying, but I am saying at least, you know, I haven't done a video about it, so I'm not willing to double down, obviously. But it is to the point, though, where I go, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just buy into it right away and that you should be surprised if it's ready that soon. And if you should be surprised, though, uh, I, that's what I, what I said to him is why? Though it should be out, like what I've what I, what I've keep saying is, I really think this needs to be out when Navi Twenty Two launches. That I wouldn't even launch Navi Twenty Two until this is ready. Like you might as well just build up more stocks so you have a bunch for the launch and wait until this is ready. Well, until you have a decent answer, and I, I think their answer to like uh, RTX is decent at this point, and a decent answer to DLSS. There's still that ammunition that. Uh, Nvidia has over AMD for why it's a better option to buy their their cards, even if they're uh, it's a bit dubious how useful their pro- those features are. Well, again, it did impress me. I did some testing with it during my 6800 XT review with a Turing card in Minecraft RTX, and it did work well in that game. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd say it is a real feature now, even if I don't think it's one of those things where I, I don't think it's to the point where you can just say, "Oh, well, this is so you know." I have to get this because of that. But it is a thing. Like if it's a tiebreaker, eh, why are you giving yeah, a video exactly. this tiebreaker, AMD? Yeah. All right. Flint Warrior writes in and says, Hi, all. We've moved from on dime memory controllers to multi core to now chiplet architecture. I'm interested to learn more about the next big leap in architectures and CPU design. Active interposers? Well, I would just say full 3D stacking, right? The ability to have effectively a larger die that when you put one die on top of the other also is able to move components right next to each other directly connected is the next big thing for sure it comes with obviously huge problems potentially if not handled correctly and it could be very expensive at first but i really think 3d stacking is the next big thing which we've seen and we'll cover in later stories with ponte vecchio and of course zen 4 yeah and then obviously that comes hand in hand with like more heterogeneous uh, architectures. Yeah. Yeah. That's the future as transistors, as we get, as they get to the uh, like literal limits that a transistor can be, <laughs> uh, they have to go 3D at some point or switch I mean, it, to a different material. Which I think would be a lot easier to just do 3D than to try to get, because again, if you try to get, for example, graphene off the ground, you're it's not competing with silicon. It's competing with, 50 years of silicon being optimized to the minutia level. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'm sure a ton of lessons that they learned from silicon can be translated to graphene, but I wouldn't bet that graphene will be a usable, like a graphene-based CPU would be usable in the next like 10 years uh, 
Not in a mainstream product is the only thing, I don't think. Uh, Ben Cannon writes in and said, I had this realization at work because of how graphene significantly, oh wow, perfect, reduces power consumption requirements for each transistor. And with less power, much less heat. Given this, what about a graphene compute process that could be used in space stations because of how much more power efficient it theoretically is? I mean, why not? Theoretically, (laughs) processors in space need to put off essentially no heat as there isn't an atmosphere for it to conduct heat away. I mean, yeah, I I don't have much to add to this except that, yes, I think it's coming. I just wouldn't double down on it being in the next few years. Yeah, and I mean, look up like, look up like graphene CPU research or something. I'm sure there are several labs around the world actively developing this, but the thing is it's in a lab. So it's not going to see consumers for a while. And are they going to get the like $20 billion of funding required to really get going when you could put that $20 billion into TSMC and in the time you got it working, TSMC's on two nanometer? No, they're probably operating on a budget of in like the scale of, I don't know, dozens of millions or something. And I'm, I haven't looked into it. So this is just off the top of my head. But no, yeah. I doubt they so have a ton us. of funding. <laughs> Well, it's the holiday season, and you know what that means. Lots of travel for this holiday season, and hopefully for a more open 2021. I bought a studio laptop for mobile editing. And of course, well, it didn't come with an open license of Microsoft Office. And those can be very expensive, especially for the professional version. But luckily, I was able to get Microsoft Office Professional for a reasonable price from cdkoffers.com. Go to cdkoffers.com and use the promotional code Broken Silicon to get 25% off an already cheap list price of Windows 10 Professional. Then all you do is click on your email account, go to user center and then my purchase orders to get the code just use this code with a normal download of windows 10 professional from microsoft's website all right links in the description all right moving on to story number five AMD's 5 nanometer next generation Zen 4 Ryzen and Epic CPUs rumored to feature over 25% IPC increase and an overall performance boost over Zen 3 of 40%. They're technically quoting through with WCCF Tech of chipsandcheese.com. Zen 4 is what a lot of people are waiting for. And if the info I have is accurate, that wait will prove to be even more worth it than its predecessor. It is important to note that the one common thread in all Zen 4 chatter I have heard is resounding positivity. From IPC gains of over 25%, a total performance gain of 40%, and even possibly, in parentheses, finally, 5 gigahertz all core thanks to the new full node N5 fabrication at TSMC. Yeah, I like what he says here with the one thing that's true with all sources is insane positivity. That I can report that too. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. What, what did you think when you saw this, Dan? Of course, there's overwhelming positivity. Like they've been, they've been hitting their goals with Zen consistently since Zen 1. So I have no doubt in my mind that, yeah, Zen 4 is going to be and based on what you've reported uh, early on about Zen 4, it seems like it's going to be maybe just as impressive as like Zen 1 to Zen 2 or better than that. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, w- I would say that I really need to remind people that I have an, a, a video from, I believe, early 2020 that was AM Domination, where I go, and it's named that because it goes through Zen 3 and then Zen 4. I go through my Zen 4 rumors i mean information in that and i just haven't seen a need to update it and and i if i remember correctly what i conveyed is they are increasing core counts they aren't necessarily going to full 3d stacking which i guess i need to make sure people understand that i did kind of say that earlier that but they are going to some more advanced 3d packaging at least and of course it's on five nanometer has newer avx more powerful avx instruction sets and has another massive ipc increase so all, what I'm hearing is he's basically reported what I've reported quite a while ago, um, and it's just the same old more cores, better IPC, and more advanced packaging. Although I will say one thing, that when I see 40% overall increase, I that's would be at the lowest estimate of what I expect. 
And for forty percent gain, is that would that be like multi-threaded, or is that just overall performance gain? They think forty percent with IPC and yeah. So he's saying like twenty nine per twenty five percent IPC and a forty percent performance. So yeah, maybe he just means single threaded. Okay, because that would be pretty big. Because that that would mean that they're that Zen four would have a pretty massive increase in uh, uh, clock speeds too, right? I mean, I well, guess that's what he said. Five gigahertz. Damn. I guess they're getting to the coveted five gigahertz, but <laughs> right. Which possibly. if I, although if I simply, you know, twenty, I don't, but there are other ways of getting uh, performance and single threaded uh, besides IPC as well, technically. So yeah, I mean, I, all I can say is I've heard that it's possibly going to ten to twelve core CCXs. Although, of course, there's oh, a, there's yeah. a lot of designs swirling around. Don't forget how many Zen three designs with like four-way hyper-threading were out there that never came to market. So, But I, I would say we can conservatively expect a 20% IPC gain and 20 core on desktop. Although personally, I expect like 25% plus IPC and 24 cores on desktop. Although I'm going to be honest, I don't know that they need more than 20 cores. I think they well, should increase core count, but I don't know that they really need it. Well, and if they went to 10 core CCXs, I think... 20 cores would be a would be a logical number that desktop would move right. to. Well, no, and I, I guess what I'm also saying though is um I'm trying to think of like, although I guess oh yeah, I guess I'll say this though. Everyone's got to remember that this isn't coming out tomorrow, right? So everyone's going, there's no way we need more than 20 cores tomorrow. Correct. But I believe Genoa should paper, which is, you know, epic, should paper mm-hmm. launch with Zen 4 at the very end of this year is what I'm hearing. And that Zen 4 desktop and laptop is early to mid-ish 2022. So keep in mind that this isn't coming for a whole other year from now, guys. Do you think maybe in over a year from now, you might want more than 20 cores? Like what will amps be doing you know, like what's going to be required to game at 240 hertz when the consoles have eight cores, you know? I don't know. A lot of this shit is like a year to a year and a half out. And the landscape changes drastically in a year, especially right now. <laughs> so yeah. 20 so twenty cores and 20 cores, 20 to 24 cores really isn't that much more based on how the market's been changing recently. Like three years ago, Four cores was like the standard. So seeing a fifty yeah. percent, seeing a fifty yeah. percent increase in core counts isn't that big of a deal anymore. Yeah, I mean that's a good point. That in 2016 the standard was four cores, and now in 20, I mean just in no, I mean yeah, in 20, I would say eight cores actually became the standard. Arguably, even just in 2018 with Zen Plus, because those 2700Xs got cheap. I, I'd say eight cores is, w- without a doubt, pretty much the standard now. You might not have the latest eight core, right? Yeah. But it is pretty much the standard. I mean, it's even in laptops. Uh, my laptop has six cores. It, it's the standard, I would say, now, just like a few years later. So, and, and if that was 2018, 2019, a few years after that, 2022, why wouldn't the standard, if it went from four to eight, go to, you know, maybe 10, 12 cores in the mid-range? Yeah, because right now I would I would agree. Like the minimum to be in mid, mid-range performance at this point is eight cores. So yeah, in 2022, 2023. A lot of people get mad at you who bought a Zen 3 6 core if you say that, Dan. <sighs> uh, Zen 3 6 core, it's probably fine for the time being. But yeah, I, I would have spent a little bit more money if I could have and gotten the eight core. It just costs extra because they can charge more. But make no mistake, the top of the stack is 16 cores, eights in the middle. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Mio writes in and says, I've been thinking about the interesting things AMD could do with Zen 4 on a new node, besides plain old more performance per watt and performance per millimeter squared. Obviously, more cores is a possibility, but keeping their cores fed with memory is already a challenge. I wonder if they could add a fat L4 chip cache chiplet on the higher core designs, maybe half a gigabyte or a gigabyte, which would help keep the cores all fed. It seems AMD is investing in their cache technology really heavily, so it makes sense. The other thing I thought of was SMT4 and a massive memory queued up to make better use of the actual computer hardware, but the other logical cores are waiting for memory. What do you think are medium term before 3D stacking advanced packaging really take off? Strategies to improve performance? Yeah, I mean, I, I continue to think that the way I would, as someone who is 
and entirely unqualified to really be making <laughs> these decisions, but you asked me. The way I would have mostly approach Zen 4 is number one IPC, you increase core counts enough. So it would be, I would want a slight increase in core counts, but that's about it. If I were to design it, I would say, could we get this to 20 cores? Could we get this to 20 cores and make them have as much IPC as possible? But with that higher IPC, maybe now they can make use of four-way hyperthreading, right? Like, do we like should we really go to 16 or, or like a 32 core? Or should we go to 20 cores, 80 threads, right? Mm -hmm. Because of how powerful each core is. We have to, we can keep them fed now, though, with four-way hyperthreading. I would just that's kind of how I would approach it. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know I, if four, it works, right? I'm an idiot. <laughs> I, I think four way SMT is it's gonna come to consumers something. At, at so, I don't yeah, know it's about gonna, consumers, but it's coming to something for sure. They're working on it for some custom server chip at least. I, I was gonna say at some point it's probably gonna come to consumers, but that might not be for that might not be this year. I think there's obviously going to be applications for four way SMT. I mean, what uh IBM have what do they have SMT at for some of their cores now? Like didn't they have like 12, eight or 12 way SMT at one point? I know they had at least eight. Yeah. Okay. So obviously there it's possible. There are some applications it would be useful for. So I think within a couple of years, you're probably going to see it in some form. And then maybe years down the line, you'll see it come to consumers when it makes sense for it to be used. Yeah. In terms of adding more cash, probably adding more memory, Probably. I mean, look at Sapphire Rapids. Intel's looking to do this type of stuff with some of their chips. So I don't know why. And that's coming out right around when Zen 4 is. So I yeah. assume AMD's looking into it as well. You know, And again, that's what I hear is that we shouldn't double down on 3D stacking for Zen 4 just yet. But there is some more advanced packaging. So there could be a slight 3D packaging going on. Very least, a more advanced than what they've done now. Yeah. That's a pretty easy guess, though. I mean, I don't need a source to know that, I guess. Nanite writes in and says, do you think we will have optical computing at the consumer level, CPUs, GPUs, motherboards, and memory within five to 10 years? Honestly, no. no. I mean, I remember seeing, I think it was like Discovery Channel or something when I watched that talking about optical computers. And like the first thing they said about it was, yeah, this is really, really hard to coordinate in a way that it's just not that hard to, it's far easier to do with electrons. Yeah. I mean, don't, never say never to anything. We're going to keep finding ways of scaling performance, but it's going to be the way of least resistance and least funding. It's just cheaper to make silicon twice as good again, yeah. even though it's getting crazy expensive than it is to try to use a new technology from the ground up. And when you say, you know, the way I'm starting to think about this is like when someone asks, how soon will we get something? I go, is there literally any suggestion from any of my sources this is being worked on on anything? I mean, even after Meteor Lake, which I've, right, like with Redwood Cove? No. And those are coming out in a few years. So do I think in a few years when those things come out, I'll be getting rumors of it? No. I, the only Maybe thing that, 10 years, but limited consumer at most, I think. Yeah, the, the only thing that would lead to them needing to develop something like that is if a hard wall is hit with using electrons for computing. Yeah. All right. Aiden FS writes this says, why does the 5800X seem to be in stock most often? Is it due to lower demand for the worst value Zen 3 part? For just $100 more, you can get the 5900X with four more cores. Or is it being produced in higher numbers for some other reasons? And I wrote down here ahead of time, it's probably a bit of both. On seven nanometer, I, on a chip this small, 70 millimeter squared, Yields are fantastic by now, and they probably don't need to disable very many of them, right? Like yeah. already they were selling with Zen 1 and Zen Plus. There were some late generation, what, like the 1600 AF. Some of those could be unlocked to eight cores with the right BIOS. Yeah. So like already that, so like, I guess that's 12 nanometers, so it's different, but I, I no, and, and I think I've already heard. God, what is it? I've already heard. I think from blokes who's a patron that some fifty six hundred X's can be unlocked to fifty eight hundred X's now. So they're already just disabling some chips that don't need to be disabled, or probably don't need to be disabled. So 
I think a lot of it is they just don't need to disable very many of them. Supply is tight and it's a chiplet's a chiplet. They make the same amount. They 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 make they spend the same amount of money making a 5800X that they make a 5600X. Uh, besides, I guess, the cooler. Yeah. Uh, the, even less than because they have to bundle a cooler with it. So they would much rather sell a 5800X. And if the yields allow it, I bet they're just not prioritizing 5600Xs. They've, they have no reason to. You know, um, and and don't forget, you know, I used to do a bunch of videos on this. If Intel was competing better, like if Rocket Lake would have launched and used less energy, like next to Zen 2, uh, I bet AMD would have launched the 5800X as an 8-core 5600X, and they would have launched a 5500X 6-core for 200, but they didn't need to. And so competition, they might as well sell for 450 and sell the ones they can make bigger profits on Intel then. If there's making the same, they're spending the same amount of money on a 5800X and a 5600X. I wonder what number of people will just be convinced to buy a 5800X instead. I bet it with, with the 5600X being unavailable. It's a it's an objectively better CPU, and it's only a hundred bucks more. Might as well spend the extra. Well, probably That's closer to hundred more f- f- fifty because you need no to get cooler the, included. Yeah, <laughs> but still. I think that convince, would convince a lot of people to just get a 5800X instead. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, if uh, the amount of people I've seen say they couldn't get a 6800 XT, so they bought a 3090 is or a 3080, <laughs> uh, like they couldn't. Like I literally the other night we were playing with our friend Brock. He said his friend got tired of waiting to get a 3080 and bought a 3090. He spent double the money. He yeah, spent so two thousand for it or something. If if um, a decent number of people are willing to spend double the money for their on their $1,500 graphics card, I'm betting a decent <laughs> amount of people would be willing to spend, what, 50% more on their CPU? Yeah. So, all right. Let us move on then to story number six. Moore's Law is Dead confirms Alder Lake IPC and multi-threaded performance. Late Sunday night on 2-14-21, Tom confirmed from a new source he had been cultivating for a while that Alder Lake would indeed bring 20% higher single-threaded performance over Tiger Lake. The direct comparison was Alder Lake U is 20% higher single-threaded performance than Tiger Lake U while using less energy. And it would also bring double the multi-threaded performance. And overall, vastly better efficiency. It should be launching in quarter three. Moore's Law is dead. Highly advises you to skip Rocket Lake, and this source does <laughs> as well. As do all other sources. Like, you know, I, I, I we'll get into more Rocket Lake stuff in a second. But uh, yeah, I mean, what do you... I mean, this here's a... This, and I, I do think it's worth pointing out, because even though I leaked in 2019 that Golden Cove would bring 10 to 20% higher... IPC than Willow Cove. And I actually, in that same week, said Willow Cove would be around 5% IPC over Ice Lake, which is also correct, by the way. Um, like, this is a direct product comparison, though. That was just vaguely 10 to 20%. Here we're seeing 20% higher single threaded, directly comparing a 15 watt chip to a 15 watt chip, to which I'm forced to conclude. So it's probably like 17% higher IPC and slightly higher clock speeds. Yeah. And so my thoughts on this are, I mean, like, let's look at the Zen 3, uh, the Zen 3 rumors or leaks or whatever you want to call it. it. It looks like Alder Lake will be competing on a far more equal playing field to Zen than they Intel has been for the past three years. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Finally, new competition. Um Hopefully, Alder Lake turns out to be as good as these sources are saying it will be, because then there will be actual competition again in the market uh, sooner rather than later, which is always better. Well, and I was very excited to get this information out there because this is, um, you know, I've had a handful of really provenly reliable Intel sources for a few years. I mean, this one, though was pretty reliable for his initial stuff. But I honestly, guys, I see no reason to rush into new sources right when it's just better to get it right than to rush something out, I think, for my channel at this point. And he had been right like three times in a row. And this was a different angle. I can't confirm much more than that on where the info came from. So I I don't know. I was very excited about this. And I said in my, you know, in the Moore's Laws Dead Discord, which you get access to if you support us on Patreon. (laughs) Dan's laughing at the peddling there. That 
you know, this with this new set from an additional source to the ones I've already had. I'm I'm very certain I'm fairly certain now that Alder Lake will be at least decent. Yeah, which was the well, worry all along because it's a more experimental seeming architecture than what they're they've generally made. Well, and it is because it's not another, I don't know. <laughs> it's not uh just Skylake again. So it's actually new. But um yeah, I, I don't know. This is really good news, is the way, I, what I would well, say. And the uh, the comparison, well, that is how you would say it, Dan, because you started by saying, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so no, the comparisons to Zen 4 should be pretty apt, too. If there's one thing that I've universally heard about Golden Cove is that's the one everyone at Intel is excited for. And that's the one they consistently also say needs to be good. Like, Intel knows this needs to be good. They pulled... They're pushing all resources towards getting it out on time. And he also said, and again, so I just want to be clear, like the way, who this source is, there's like direct connections to. I don't want to say more, but yeah, it is coming out quarter three, guys. It is going to be this level of performance. The, the, the stage of this, how should I put it, information is much more final than like a whisper. <laughs> and I guess the, fu- the big thing is how will... Uh, how, how will, uh, what is it, 16 cores, 24 threads compete with possibly 20 cores, 40 threads? That's, they're still behind or on core. Or, yeah, or more, yeah. They're, they're still massively behind on core counts. Who knows how much that matters in the near term? Long term, I think it still might matter, but near term, I mean, 20, 24 threads is a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, so, and that, there's a few things I want to, like kind of maybe not clarify is the word, but emphasize about the leak, right? So in the comments on YouTube, I saw a lot of people going, see, this is why you can't underestimate Intel. They're about to crush them. And it's like, well, uh, eight big cores with 16 threads and plus eight little cores isn't going to outright beat the 5950X. And this is launching a year after the 5950X launched. So... This is better than Comet Lake, yeah, and Rocket Lake for sure, but this is no Zen killer. Not even not even really Zen 3. By the time this launches, Andy will probably be meeting demand and be happy to drop prices a bit. And, and they may even have a Zen 3 Plus out. I don't think this is like an AMD killer. It just finally stops this erosion of falling behind. Because if we're being honest, like, Again, this is a comparison I've kept making. Like it got to the point where AMD was competing with their previous generation, pretty much. Right. Yeah. You had you had Intel, or you yeah, you had AMD launching Zen one, then Zen Plus, that's like seven percent better. Then one year later, Zen two that doubles the cores, adds another 10% IPC or whatever. And then Intel's just like, we added two cores, you doubled them, we added two. Like, and like it's like as much as Intel kept releasing better stuff, they were falling more behind. This is the end of the more falling behind trend, but they're still behind, guys. Yeah, and that's another thing to say is like beating a uh, your competitor's lineup. What will this be like? Nine months after it comes out, isn't a huge no, it's victory. 12. 12 it's months? almost okay. twelve months. Yeah, yeah. So beating your competitor's lineup, uh, uh, we'll just say a year after yeah. it comes out, isn't it? It isn't impressive. It's expected. It's good news that they're finally able to do that again. But that's that's they're doing the bare minimum, and all they're like is just the beginning of. I it, is the beginning of Intel being competitive again. It's not Intel is crushing Zen. They might beat Zen three three months before three to four months before Zen four comes out. Yeah, and well, I guess I should have meant what I said. It's not really a year, I guess. Yeah, you're right. It's it's it could be nine months actually. Yeah, it could if, be. Act- yeah, if it were like September, September, right? That would, no, that would be the beginning of well, Q four, right? But Zen launched in like November, so it it could it could be nine months. Yeah. Um. So I guess that's true, but also like it's not like it's beating even the entire Zen three lineup. And I mean, a couple other things to point out. You know, like I did this math where I tried to aggregate the total core performance, right? Combining the little and the big cores. And there were two things that I think people missed as well, or maybe drew the long conclusions from my perspective, which is to say, 
One of them was about the Grace Mock course, which from what I'm hearing have about Skylake IPC, which I think is pretty awesome. I mean, that's a level of performance where you can reasonably put an atom only chip in a laptop that's cheap and it doesn't suck for sure. Um, so that's exciting. But keep in mind, though, they're saying, well, wait, so we'll just have 9,900Ks in phones? No, I said <laughs> Skylake IPC. I didn't say Skylake clock speeds, and they don't have hyperthreading. Yeah, they I, they have eight very pa- they have eight pretty powerful cores for what atoms have been cores have been in the past, and I'm sure there will be some great like low power uh, Gracemont based laptops that we'll see. But no, it's not it's not like you're just getting an i7, I guess, or an i7 by today's standards tacked R- onto it. Right. It's you're not just getting, you know, it's it's you're not getting an i9 in the background. You're getting yeah. an underclocked 9700K, which is a last gen i7. You know, someone in the comments said, "So what? It's just going to have a background chip that's as powerful as my i5." And it was like a quad core i5 and there's like, "Yeah, <laughs> but people were like, keep in mind, your i5 is five years old. Skylake's five years old. You should hope Adam gets this good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I just don't know how people have forgotten how far behind Intel is. Yes, I know that Zen was behind an IPC for a while, but it did so well using even less, like half the energy and double the cores. Like it was overall more efficient architecture, no matter how you dice it. Even in gaming, it was more efficient at gaming. It just lost by 10%, you know? And and we should really expect this, you know? Being I, I, you know, Skylake IPC, it's like, yeah, well, Golden Cove is like 50% more than that, so... <laughs> And well, has it, it, two threads per core. <laughs> I mean, it's because uh, depending on your perspective and when you started really waking up to the fact that Zen, what, uh, that AMD was dominant in the CPU space, uh, we had been at the same status quo for like four years because some people would have even argued that, uh, like if you look online, some people even argued Intel was beating them through Zen 2, which I think is ridiculous. Preposterous but- <laughs> and the sales don't reflect that's what everyone thought. Yeah, but some people thought that. So it's like, oh, seeing sky eight skylight cores and level cores in the background, people are like, how how are they doing that? It's because thing things get better over time, and for some reason, you just didn't notice that. Yeah, and Intel wasn't getting better while AMD was, and so yeah. You know, but and so I guess the other things to touch on is just so yeah. I mean, like I basically came to the conclusion that you know on desktop Alder Lake. We can expect those eight Golden Cove cores to probably perform like, you know, I don't know, almost 10, uh, not a little less than 10 Rocket Lake cores. And then the little cores in the background, they don't have hyper threading, they have much less IPC, but it's basically the equivalent of like 12 to 13 Rocket Lake cores. And they'll be doing so while using less energy. And yeah, as far as I'm aware, they're going to slot it in at the exact same price by the way. So that Rocket Lake i9 that's $500, the Alder Lake i9 should be below 600 at most, and it will be at least 50% better while mm-hmm. using less energy. And it could be a great, great gaming CPU. So it, lo- it makes Rocket Lake look bad, but keep in mind, when I say 12 to 13 Rocket Lake cores, that's not beating the top of even Zen 3 still, though. But it could no. crush laptop again, maybe. Yeah, it, once again, it's the beginning of them coming back. It's not their comeback. And the final thing to emphasize about this is the interesting discussion about performance per watt per millimeter squared that's going on with the big little design. Because, you know, I think a lot of people see that and they're like, why do they put any amount of little cores if they're weaker? And it's like, well, the little cores take up a, an atom cluster, takes up the same amount of space as a big core. At least that's true with Lakefield. Right, and, and, I, I, and I'm told it's probably true with Golden Cove and Gracemont as well. Like, Lakefield has one Sunny Cove core, and that takes up the same amount of die space as the Quad Core Atom Cluster, which I think are Tremont cores. So, yeah, I mean, like, if the, big, if the little cores were more than half as good as the big cores, you might as well just put mostly little cores by a huge margin because they take up less space and use less energy. Which I'm sure there will, there will be some... Uh, some- CPUs that have that uh, configuration that are mostly 
Well, so that's uh, the interesting discussion. I'm fairly convinced, as I said in my video, that the top mobile chips will be six big cores plus eight little cores. And that should be the P suffix. So that's the 28 watt. Uh, but some of the U's will probably be two big cores, eight little. Like I've seen a lot of suggestions that that's what the I3s or I5s may be even. It's the I7s that will get more big cores, and that that might just perform fine. Look, you got two big cores that can bounce around the top thread, and then eight little skylight cores without hyper threading. That yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're using that, if you're you have a laptop, and mostly what you're doing is like browsing the internet. Well, that <laughs> I'm sure that will handle that incredibly well. Yeah, and again, you really don't need that many big cores as long as it works well, which exactly. you'll have to see in reviews. But that is the optimization of performance per watt per millimeter squared. Basically, the little cores, it seems like, are about 20% more efficient in performance per watt per, per space taken up. But there's a certain amount of big cores you're just going to want to have at a certain point. you mm -hmm. know. So it is an interesting balance where they're kind of going with both of them. At long term, if they get it working really well, I could see them totally considering doing something like, yeah, I mean, like eight, like six big cores on desktop and then like 32 little cores. Although there's some pretty big penalties in interconnect that you might run into in a small space if you try to do that. So that's also oh, what I yeah. mean. It would be interesting though if their I don't their Atom CPU started to outpace performance per area. <laughs> yeah. So, and they just started running with that instead. All right. Ike's writes in and says, what are your thoughts on the leaked 11900K benchmarks? Something seems off with them. Well, you know, that brings us to Ike's story number seven. So someone stole and reviewed an Intel i7-11700K engineering sample, aka Rocket Lake, quoting from TechSpot. Four years ago, Intel closed up shop in Romania. They've continued to sell their processors there, but without a local office, and their media support has been woeful, says Lab501, a local tech publication in Romania. Of the 21 Intel processors Lab 501 has received since being left in the lurch, five came from Intel's UK office, all arriving after the embargo lifted, 12 came from their friends in the industry, and one they purchased themselves, and three from anonymous industry sources. Those three chips in 8700K, 8600K, and 10980XC, these are the anonymous industry sources that got them to them, caused trouble for Intel. Once 501 stopped receiving review samples from Intel, they stopped being beholden to the review embargoes when the chips they've reviewed have been provided by their industry friends. So they've respected the embargo for their friends' sake, but when the chips have arrived without Intel's permission, they've also sometimes published reviews ahead of time, much to Intel's chagrin, which is what they've just done. 501 has tested an 11700K Rocket Lake engineering sample before the processor could be officially revealed. And admittedly, there's not much left for Intel to reveal in our opinion. It's generally known what the processor will have eight cores, 16 threads, and is a variant of the Cyperscope architecture and have boost clocks of around five gigahertz. But there's been a fiery debate surrounding the processor's performance. In games, Lab 501 found it performs similar to other flagship processors like the 10900K and 5950X. Its performance was very distinct from those other processors oftentimes. It often had high or low minimum frame rates, and in some games it struggled unexpectedly, perhaps explained because this is, again, an engineering sample. Overall, though, it wasn't any better or worse than what's out now. All right, and I also have a link to a 10900K benchmark, which kind of found similar things. It wins at some things, but it generally is just trades blows with their existing flagship. What do you make of all of this, Dan? Well, I mean, it's not surprising. I, I'm looking at the benchmarks right now, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem to be too far outside of the range of every other uh, CPU on the market, which, you know, that's kind of what I expected. <laughs> I don't, yeah. I don't know how else to add to it. Uh, it makes me wonder if I should have done a video on this and just titled it, What Did You Expect? He, yeah, I, I was expecting the 11700K to be an entirely uninteresting CPU unless it's priced at something like $300 or $350. Yeah. So, I, I mean, honestly, though, so I guess let me, let's do step by step here. Number one, these results don't really surprise me. They're 
using a, you know, these, in, I, you, my friend Brock has an engineering sample, a Broadwell 10 corner, it works fine. These things don't typically really have lower performance except for if they have lower clock speeds. And it seems like this didn't. This is the final chip, basically. The only thing you'd think about is maybe it takes more voltage than usual or something. But in games, it should run fine unless the code isn't there, but eh, they're using a motherboard that can run it. So all I can say is, yeah, there's probably some weird performance in a few things because all the drivers aren't done, but some of those are not going to change on review day. This is pretty close to the final report performance. I would just recommend throw out the really weird cases and look at the ones that aren't weird. And this is, I, I Intel themselves in their own usually cherry-picked benchmarks showed it 4% better than a 5900X. It's not even AMD's top chip. So the fact that this not in a cherry-picked setting trades blows with a 5950X and a 10900K doesn't surprise me. It just does not surprise me at all. Yeah. Ro- Rocket Lake was always bound to be a... Uh, I, I, I don't know if I want to say uninterest stupid architecture just because it lowers their core counts on the top end by two cores. So I'm assuming it will have worse multi-threaded performance and slightly better single-threaded performance. Yeah, um, and and honestly, the debate about if you should take this seriously <clears throat> just reminds me of Vega Frontier reviews. You know, rumors were swirling forever about how good Vega could be and blah, blah, blah. And then about three months before Vega came out, the rumors started to become... Eh, it's probably not going to beat the 1080 Ti guys. Lower your expectations. And the AMD fanboys just couldn't believe it. And then Vega Frontier reviews came out from people who got it early and no one believed it. And the second I saw the Vega Frontier benchmarks, I was like, well, there it is. I guess it's not beating a 1080 Ti and it'll be probably in between the 1080 and 1080 Ti at best. You know, yeah. like it is what it is, guys. And I remember similar things with the initial Vega Frontier review, which some games, you know, yeah, the drivers it underperformed a bit, but so what? Some of the games it was clearly just around a 1080, and that's what you should expect. You so you really shouldn't expect anything more than like, I don't know, 10% better than the minimums that are off. You know, I I, I don't think it's going to be even 10%. I think it'll maybe narrowly win in low single digits over Zen 3. That's always what I thought. And yeah, I don't know. What is there, <laughs> what else is there to say? That's this is Rocket Like this doesn't seem off to me at all. Yeah, and I, I I don't know what to say about the people that say these seem off. Like, I guess I don't know much that much about the website Lab uh, Five Hundred One. Like, uh, do they have a track record for making stuff up? It doesn't seem like any of the reporting on it no. says that they do. And so I don't think there's any reason to suspect that they're lying. Maybe it maybe it's a lower performant um, engineering sample, but I don't know. We're how how far out are we from getting Rocket Lake uh, released? It's probably close to, if not the finished product. Well, and another thing to highlight is maybe Ike's, for example, who wrote in to us, says these look off because Intel claims some pretty high IPC gains. I mean, yeah, you guys got to remember, though, that what Tiger Lake, they said, was bringing higher IPC and I conveyed 5% to my leaks. And there were some things where it was 10% higher, but there were some IPC regressions in the new architecture yeah. because of how they organized the cache and some benchmarks. And so I'm sure there's some, you know, whatever they claimed it was, I think they tried to claim 19% higher IPC than Skylake, so around Ice Lake IPC, basically. Yeah, I'm sure in some things it will be, but in some games it just won't be. I don't see that. And, and it has less cores. And and again, I really got to emphasize this, guys. This isn't like before where just adding a bunch of IPC always necessarily gets you more performance, especially with how Intel spreads out its heat dissipation between cores as one gets hot and move over to another one as it boosts around. Like, games use eight cores now. Games use 10 cores. All, most games I check use more than 12 threads at least. Like you, like typically they go up to at least 20 pretty efficiently. So this idea that it loses two cores, it could affect gaming performance a little bit in some of these games. And that's why its performance may be a little bit less in some of them. Like you can still run all these games with fewer cores, but I mean, like even Mountain Blade, like that uses all of your cores pretty well. Like it, yeah, <laughs> it uses them pretty. It equally. really does too. I've tested with the 6800 XT. You know, this is a graphics bottleneck, not it, CPU. It, and like the scheduling for like my 2700X is definitely not as good as yours. 
But multi-threading is a lot. It, games do do multi-threading well now. They're not just using two cores like what is it? User benchmark wants you to believe. <laughs> yeah. Story number eight. Moore's Law's Dead Leaks incredible FP62 performance for Intel Ponte Vecchio. Although PVC is technically referred to as a GPU, its star seems to be shining brighter than DG2. On February 9th, Moore's Law is Dead leaked some shocking info about Intel's upcoming 41 chiplet monster. And I just kind of summarized it here. The product shown off by Raja on Twitter is in fact a dual tile Ponte Vecchio chip now. I know there's a bunch of chiplets, but supposedly the tiles themselves have that many chiplets. Um, additionally, it has one-to-one, as far as I'm told, like FP32 to FP64 compute, doubling down on just optimizing for FP64 compute, as this is meant for machine learning. And like I've heard, I've been told like 99.6% like of scientific workloads are double precision. So it does double precision at 46 teraflops, which I think some people saw 46 teraflops and they're like, so what, it's around MI100 or, you know, a little better than Ampere? It's like, no, it's over double the A100. It, yeah, because A100 is like, what, 20 teraflops I think, around? I think it depends if you, and, and, and I apologize if I get this wrong, anyone listening, but I believe what I read on the white paper was using Tensor, it gets 19.5, but in okay. some workloads, it might be forced to use about half that. I don't know, right? Usually, FP64 is at best um, half of FP32, and it's often far, far less than that. Uh, but not in this case. In this case, it's it's is all they got, and it's it has more FP sixty four teraflops than Ampere does. It's is absolutely a, an insane number. And there's additionally to continue, you know, around four hundred and forty two megabytes of L three cache, which I'm not saying the exact number either for the teraflops or the L three cache because I don't want the exact number to date maybe when this information leaked out, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's a massive amount of L3 cache, and it's unlikely to be the Rambo cache. So there's that much L3 cache, and there's something called Rambo cache that links the compute chips together. And then there's also 3.2 terabytes per second of bandwidth as of now, or around there, I should say, it's not the exact number, of 128 gigabytes of HBM2E. So bandwidth, bandwidth, cache, cache, cache. And the point, one of the main points of my video came to this. As far as I'm hearing, and I've always heard this too, I've never heard problems with this, you know, non-gaming. Technically, it's a GPU, but it's really a GP GPU. And it's getting vastly more funding behind it than DG2 is. And also, I think even more importantly, it has less design constraints, right? They're trying to perfect 3D stacking, multi-chip packaging, and one of the main constraints on that is heating, but also cost. So if that, you know, like what you're seeing here, oh, we're having a problem scaling performance across these two chiplets. Add more cash. Oh, <laughs> we need more bandwidth. Here's 128 gigabytes because they can afford, if a graphics card costs more than 400 bucks to make, they can't afford it. If this costs 10,000 to make, probably a market for it though. So yeah. that's where all of this comes from. And that's why I believe it's not having as many problems. Having said that, I also communicated that I know they still say it's a 2021, late 2021 release date. What I was hearing from my sources is not ready till 2022. And in fact, today from another source, I just heard it's probably not coming out till 2022. So if it comes out this year, it's probably a paper launch, even though well, they're saying it'll be ready. And it's important to break down like what, what does that even mean with a GPU like this, where it's, it, it's going to be, they're not going to make a ton of these. I think its main use is it's going to be put in a super, some type of supercomputer. So it's the Aurora, getting, us, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's getting made, and it's going to be out at some point. We're never going to be able to get our hands on it, <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting proof of concept that like having that many chiplets on a GPU works, and it's insanely powerful too. And I don't know some of our ideas on like how compute works seem to break down a little bit with this, given that it's. FP32 and FP64 uh, compute is identical. Although I'm guessing the Aurora supercomputer doesn't do any FP32 tasks, which is why FP64 or many FP32 tasks. It's still a lot of 32, tasks. though, technically. Yeah. 
Yes, it is. But I'm guessing the FP64 was needed to be emphasized for that supercomputer. Certainly seems so. Yeah. So like, what is even a paper? What I was trying to say is like, what does even a paper launch mean? I, I, I'm i curious, like how yeah. many, how many systems this is even going to go into outside of that um, Aurora supercomputer? Well, yeah, you, you could almost think of this as kind of an R&D project. You know, if they can make yeah. this successfully, the amount they'll learn that they can apply to Meteor Lake, which I believe uses a lot of the similar technologies I'm hearing in this, actually, you know, which will come to consumers and maybe not DG2, but maybe DG3 or DG4. You know, they needed some project where cost wasn't a problem to bring these packaging technologies to other consumer products eventually. So that's how this does affect gamers. I think what you're looking at is not coming to consumers soon, but is the future. In three years, I think we will start seeing consumer products like this. I mean, and we might even see half steps to that with like RDN. RDN A3, I don't even know if it's fair to call it a half step to that. We'll see, you know. Well, so... What were you going to say? Uh, and we're caught, we, uh, on an earlier question, like we talked about uh, heterogeneous architectures, this seems to be about as heterogeneous as an architecture <laughs> can be, as, as we understand yeah. it right now. There seems to be like six fucking different types of cache in it. It's, it's a beast yeah. with a ton, uh, clearly a ton of design put into it. But yeah, it is worth emphasizing. This is important to gamers because this is the technology I think we'll see in a few years, mm -hmm. but it doesn't affect us really that much right now it's it's an entirely different funding it's it's not the same as dg2 which did make me laugh when i saw in the comments some people say it's only going to be used for mining anyways wow people some people really don't know what uh <laughs> how the computer hardware space works do they? <laughs> Trying to make that better, but we wait until you see the insane hot takes in a few minutes. Let us get <laughs> to the wrap up, Dan. So here we are. This is, let me write that down for the timestamp. I mean, this is, of course, stories I didn't think were meant to be main stories, but I think are worth talking about. One of them on here, I, you know, usually I would just ask what you want to talk about first. One that I do need to cover right away is that we do finally have PS5 die shots. Did you see that? Yeah. So I don't, it's funny. I saw some people saying, I hope you do a video on this. I, I hope you have something to say about this. I really don't have much to say, right? Uh, it's pretty much what you would expect. A modified Zen RDNA, don't put a number next to it because it's custom architecture. Um, it doesn't have infinity cache is, I guess, the biggest thing. But while I definitely speculated it could early on, I never doubled down on that, at least not to my memory. And I, I specifically remember tons of comments like, will you put your... Oh, man, I remember these fanboys. And the, you, Dan's already laughing because he saw them, I'm sure. Will you put your integrity on the line that it has infinity cache? And I would just reply, no. Yeah. And they'd be like, be what? Then why are you saying it does? Is that what people on Reddit are saying? Because I'm not saying that. I'm saying I think it could based on what I've heard about its cache performance. But if it's not Infinity Cache, then I guess it's just the cache scrubber. Yeah, and <laughs> will you put your integrity on the line? No, because if you're saying, I think it could, that inherently means you're not certain about this. So that, why would you stake your integrity on something you don't think it, you don't necessarily think is true? I mean, it's important to say, like, since we've been talking about it for a while, that, yeah, it, could, that it could happen. Uh, the, the record needs to be set straight. And no, it doesn't have infinity cash. But no, I, I would not. You would never in, have staked your integrity, whatever the hell that even means, honestly, I know. Uh, on it having infinity cash. I'm not, I don't want, and I'm not doing this to call anyone out, but I'm not yeah. Red Gaming Tech. I didn't do five videos about it being 3D stacked with, you know, unified cash. That's not what I said. And the the unfortunate thing is I do know of some PlayStation fanboy channels like MBG Gaming or something misquoted the shit out of me over and over, basically using me as a hammer to hit Xbox fanboys with. And then the Xbox fanboys did the same. And it's like, I mean, it's hard because it's like I want my content to be shared, but can you not lie about what I'm saying? It's not, I, I don't even think it's lying. I think it's just... I, I, well, I think it is. People, That's not what I said. Well, 
it, it, it's not truthful, but it's like, I think people take, hear what they want to hear a lot of the time and then take that as the real quote. And I, yeah. I don't even think they realize they're doing it. Which it's funny. Cause it's like, it's like, ah, oh, he's trying to hide. And like one thing that was being shared was this weird re upload of a clip of a live stream on Twitter video. So you can't even watch the rest of what I said. And I cool. just responded with, Here's what I say 30 seconds later. And I'm like, it's not RDNA 3, to be clear. It's not RDNA 4. Neither the Xbox nor the PlayStation are either architectures fully. Neither of guys, neither of them have Infinity Cache. Neither yeah. of them. They're custom architectures. And I know that they have their own ways of even doing like a variable rate shading. Microsoft said as much in a presentation. These are custom architectures meant only for gaming. Uh, I, I, the only thing you can do is you can clip out one like 30 second part because I got really mad at fanboy spamming me, but I immediately corrected what I said, like 30 seconds later, like just to be clear, I don't actually mean this literally, but you know, what can you do? And it was funny. I responded just with, why don't you just show the full video and like showed a timestamp to it where I said it doesn't have RDNA three in the video he was sharing or pretending to share. And yeah, not a, not a whole lot of coherent answers to when I did that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I looked a little bit at in those threads and it's like, well, it's more of a matter of if you did the X or like, what what the hell are you even talking about? If you take a quote out of context and then you, the person that was and being re -uploaded, quoted, uploaded as a new video that cuts out parts of what I said, these fucking liars. Yeah. And, it, and they, there, I guess I will say, no, that pro person probably was intentionally misconstruing <laughs> yeah. what you were saying. Um, <laughs> If you correct the record, there's by literally just showing the full quote, there's no correction you need to make because you yeah. didn't you you didn't uh, get the full context of what you were saying. Which again, there's nothing hiding here. Links are in the description, geniuses. <laughs> Which and what made it even funnier too is I don't know if you I don't know if this links in the description, Dan. Did you see like literally Twitter accounts named Xbox Fanboy? And as I started clicking on a and there really weren't that many people that said anything, actually. You don't even see it in the YouTube comments almost at all. No one in the Discord brought it up. So it's like anyone who actually watched in good faith doesn't think this, but yeah, I, I checked the Twitter accounts of these people. All of them were just like, you know, uh, Master Chief jizzing on people from Gears of War. Like, might as well have been their picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, non-biased accounts is what you're trying to say, right? Literally in the description, Xbox fanboy account. Oh, like, I know. I, literally I've... in the description. I've seen and then some there, of those. And then I pointed that out and he's like, well, me, well, well, maybe I'm a fanboy, but you also won. And it's like, wow, real smart guys. But yeah, the, the the so to be clear, I definitely thought there could have been other things going on, whether it's a unified cash, a more unified cash system, or I never I always thought 3D stacking was a tall order, although both Cortex and Red Gaming Tech seemed to think that was what was going on. Um, but uh I I and uh, what else was there? I mean, I mean, there were definitely other things I thought could be in there that it turns out there aren't, but I was never yeah. sure of that, guys, you know? And and what it really comes down to is, well, how... I'm just trying to explain why it's outperforming the Xbox in most games. That, that's all I'm doing with those... Uh, with speaking on those rumors. Is it's like, well, something's got to be up, but I actually include a link to... You know, I literally was just like, well, what's a recent game? I haven't checked, you know. I didn't see any from NX Gamer that I thought would be good, but I saw the um, Ultimate, what is it, uh, Control Ultimate Edition video from Digital Foundry. And yeah, they found stuttering and problems with frame drops on the Series X version of Control Ultimate Edition, and they weren't in the PlayStation 5 version. So guys, I'm just trying to explain why this is happening. And a better memory system would have explained it for me. But at this point, you know, one thing that's been consistently been suggested to me by sources is that a lot of it's probably software. And I think that directly Digital Foundry suggests that it seems to be just using DirectX that have the same problems like a DirectX game has, where you have to like compile shaders in live, like in real time instead of having them pre-compiled. There seems to just be a very real software advantage on the PS5 side that as long as the Xbox uses DirectX, and it's always going to, isn't going away. Yeah, which was ironically a thing they advertised as some huge benefit to the yeah, I don't know Xbox why they, for some reason. It's yeah. like, 
it's an API that's meant to be used across a bunch of different like cards. hundreds of different components. Why would yeah. you advertise that? That's yeah, not a in, good thing. Like infinite permutations of those components. Like it's it's a good general API, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's great for a closed environment. It's not ideal for efficiency, right? Yeah, and I was, yeah. and again, you know, again with all this other stuff, just I'm trying to explain. Why in some of these benchmarks I've seen doing CPU benchmarks, there are some games like Crisis that seem to have less frame dips or no frame dips actually on the PS5, whereas they do on the strongest CPUs you can get on a PC. And I just go, well, something's got to be going on here and it's software bottlenecks. The PS5 doesn't seem to have it. Although, again, there's a reason this isn't a main story, which is it's not fully annotated yet. Maybe the pictures will be and there will be more analysis by the time this podcast comes out. You know, this is being recorded Monday night. But, eh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't just want the initial annotations either. I would like to put it past some hardware engineers I talk to and see what they think, you know, yeah. before I have any real opinions. That's why it's not a main story yet. But we basically talked about it like it was one. I guess the final thing to mention is people would point out, like, what about, like, RDNA 3 stuff? And it's like, well, let's be very clear. Uh, I won't say which recent guest, but one of them that does, you know, write software for gaming hardware he has uh, for his job. Like he said that looking at the way the PS5 is handling cache and its code is not how it's done on RDNA 2 on either the Series X or on desktop. So it's probably the, what they're doing at the cache scrubber is probably similar to something that's going on with RDNA 3. I don't know, though. That's just what I've been told consistently by developers is there's things going on with the cache management that just isn't in RDNA 2. Yeah. So outside of that, I don't know that there's much else we can say. And the unfortunate thing, too, when it comes to anything else, whether it's like how the geometry engine's organized or blah, 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 right? All of that stuff, there's nothing we can do unless Sony does a hot chips-like presentation like Xbox did, where they literally go through... even with um annotated die shots you can't tell everything right yeah and i doubt we'll ever get that from sony so no they just don't do that there's always some level of mystery in their products at least lately all right let us move on to the rest of the wrap-up then that basically was its own story i guess um i mean i everything else here dan is there anything of these stories that came out in the past couple weeks that stick out to you like what like did you look into the zen 3 failure rates at all Oh, um, I did a little bit. So it, it's for from one story from a, I believe he's a, a a custom PC maker that sells PCs. And he said, I think a batch of uh, RDNA 3, and not RDNA 3, Zen 3 uh, uh, CPUs he got were like, I think he said like 12 to 16% of them were defective. I don't know if there is like some weird bad batch, if there was a fluke. There doesn't seem to be any reporting outside of this one story that there's a super high failure rate among Zen 3, though. So I, I, I really don't know what else to say. Like, I'm not accusing him of lying. He probably just got a bunch of bad components for some reason. And if a bunch of people start RMAing them soon, we'll see. But that that's the most I can say. Yeah, and I and I know Hardware Unbox has taken an interest in this, and I looked at some of his stuff. Um, I don't have a link next to me. I'm just going off of memory. But what he his conclusion was is you can't directly say that either. I think he talked to some distributor who said their return rate was exactly the same as usual, like maybe like within what you would expect, like margin of error. Yeah. So I guess keep track of it because maybe something will start coming out. But right, it's I on my radar. From from what he was saying, like these were these CPUs, like I, I think it, they weren't even like posting into the BIOS or anything. So like they were completely completely broken. Yeah. Um, so let me see what else we got here. I mean, there's also like Sapphire Rapids or yeah, pictures, which is interesting. Gigantic sa- <laughs> Golden Cove Xeon samples <laughs> going around right now that have. Hey, this confirms, by the way, what we were saying, which it, I think it does, which is it's basically a Zen 1 organization, not like some custom IO die thing, as far as I can tell. Mm-hmm. Let me look at this. That's the last link in the wrap up there, Dan. Um, I think we'll see, though. And then otherwise, let me just look through here quickly. Um, I mean, yeah, so there's that delitted Samsung building a fab in the US. I expect more people to do that. Um, a toxic RDNA 2 card seemed to be coming out. One looked like it could be liquid cooled. That doesn't surprise me at all. I think we all expected. It's, know, it's time they crazy re- additions, right? 
Yeah, it's if they're going to bring it that uh, moniker out, it's time to do it again. Right, which I recommend anyone who wants to know like why they haven't ha- why Sapphire hasn't had a toxic edition of an AMD graphics card for a while. Go listen to the Sapphire Ed Broken Silicon episode from I think end of 2019. Um that's out there. Uh let me see what else. And 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 I will just say it's definitely ripe for one. I mean, I hopefully will have my 6800 XT review out after this podcast goes live like shortly after. And yeah, it was, I just turned up the clock to, it, granted it was the Sapphire Nitro Plus, so I think it's the one of their best bin ones, but I was just able to run it like 2.8 gigahertz, like just <laughs> that easily. I just ran it at 2.8 and I was looked at it, it was running at 2.8 gigahertz. I'm sure a Toxic Edition could have stock clocks of like 2.8 at least. And if Which they that put... That would be very cool. <laughs> and if they put 18 gigabit per second memory on it, yeah, I mean, I think they could launch a 6900 XT that's possibly 20% stronger or at least 10, 15% at stock than the standard one. And that would just blow away everything. I mean, that would be yeah. pretty cool to see. And that's the point of toxic cards. It's it really bring bring a bring it up a higher one tier, tier in performance. Yeah. Yeah. Than the which is what they card. used to do. But they can't, you know, when they had like a eight gigabyte 290X clock 20%, like 10% faster. Like, but that was the last time they could even attempt it, really. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I don't know what else do you want to talk about, really? I mean, 3060 preemptively marked up before it launches, no surprise. AMD very unhappy with their capacity issues, which doesn't surprise me absolutely at all. Um, let me see, which actually I think we have. Yeah, we have one reader mail about that. So let's go into that. TSPCFS writes in and says, this isn't really a question, but on a technical note, for everyone clamoring about no supply, how NVIDIA AMD should have predicted demand. Remember that the lead time for starting to fab the GPU die to it hitting the market is seven plus months on these newer nodes. <clears throat> Maybe five months if you do hot lots, which would downplay capacity a fab can run massively. Also, as a so- historical side, AMD end up with tons of Hawaii GPUs when mining boomed because the time it took to then ramp up volume, mining crashed, and they ended up losing money, making a lot less money than if they hadn't flooded the market at all. I thought this was an important question to read. Yeah, and that's why you're never going to see AMD try to flood the market after a mining boom again because they lost a ton of money on it. And NVIDIA almost did too. Like yeah. NVIDIA really <laughs> did some stuff to do that. And it's a, a, important to note that like, yes, the, you don't want to be so uh, supply constrained that people just start buying your competitors' products, which is what's happening to an extent right now. It's like, well, yeah. I need a new CPU. I'll just get the Intel one or whatever because I can't, I can't get Zen 3. Um, <laughs> but y- you also don't want to just you don't want to outstrip demand immediately because that means you're just going to have a bunch of cards that don't sell. Yeah, otherwise here, I don't really see... I guess Google Stadia stops developing games is actually, I think, a big deal. Like To me, that already shows they're starting to retreat from all of these gigantic things they said they were going to do. Once again, uh, streaming doesn't seem to work. The only... The only one that it really works at all on or that it's being used at all seems to be PlayStation Now. Even people that use PlayStation Now say, well, it's not that great. I haven't heard great things about it recently. I used to hear okay things, but... Yeah, but it's... Or or with Stadia, I guess, with Cyberpunk. But it's like, that's an extreme circumstance. Yeah, so PlayStation Now seems to be the only one that does streaming okay, and even they're not doing it very well. Yeah. So, and yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to add about Google St- Stadia. I, it seemed like it was failing the second it came out. Yeah, I guess the final things to add here, I do, I guess, want to give a mention. I've already mentioned this in a couple of videos and on Twitter, but the whole demand thing, it needs to be stated for the record. I got so, I mean, honestly, I feel like this channel came under siege during the holiday season because people just would not believe our reporting on the shipment numbers from AMD. There, It's official, guys. Zen 3 sold exactly as many as I said it would, over a million, and also... Guys, I'm sorry. Big Navi, I think they said sold three times, like what Vega did or whatever. Yeah, that's something like that. Yeah. So it's over. AMD shipped more high end cards this holiday season than they did with previous launches. This is just demand. It's not AMD line. 
AMD didn't pull an ultimate play. There wasn't three months of no cards on the market, which has been provably what happened with Ampere. They shipped more cards than Ampere did at their launch, more than they ever have before for a flagship at this price level. And it sold out that quickly. And people, that- people mad about availability need to look in a mirror. Gamers are making this happen. Not anyone else. And yeah, I, I've seen online people like, well, yeah, sure, there might be availability, but there isn't availability in Norway. And it's like, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. They don't prioritize that market as much as they do America. It's an unfortunate reality. I wish they could prioritize everyone equally so everyone could get their stuff, but they can't. <laughs> and that's always and that's been not the an, case. And that's not an argument against no, that's not an argument against availability. That's just nor you. against Norway. No, or should it, it be? It's Fuck no, you, it's Vikings. A, it, <laughs> yeah, sure. It, it, it's not. It's an yeah, argument. Sure. Let's become the anti-Norway podcast. It, it's just you venting your frustration, and it's fine that you're frustrated, but admit that that's what it is. You're just frustrated. Yeah. So, and and it's not me doing this, guys. It's and, and that's the thing is. I mean, it's pretty uniform from context I have now at Best Buy, Micro Center, and a few other places that, no, they have AMD cards on the shelves. I check my local Micro Center. They're there, guys. They just sell for $1,000, and it's because they are selling for $1,000. Sorry. Yeah. People are buying them for that price. I don't think they should, as you'll see in my 6800 XT review, <laughs> but it's what's happening, and... I just say, if you think it's worth that much, then I guess do it. But otherwise, don't try. To, don't feel like you have to convince yourself it is just because everyone else is. Because you know, one 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 point I'm going to make in my 6800 XT review is I'm going to show me playing like Resident Evil 2, you know, an 1800p 100 frames instead of 4K one like 120. I'm going to go. So here's my gaming experience. This instead of this. Oh no. Yeah. So, so what I was just going to say to that is. Um, 6,800 XT isn't worth a thousand dollars or value is subjective. So if you think it's worth a thousand dollars, it's worth a thousand dollars. But then in the next second sentence, it's not worth a thousand dollars. Don't spend a thousand dollars on it. It's stupid. <laughs> like, yeah, if you want to, you can buy it, but you're, I, I do think you're wasting money. All right, Dan. Final reader mails. Greeny writes in and says, Hello, Tom and co host. That would be Dan this time, Greeny. My question is, what did you make of AMD's recent quarterly report? They did well, and yet the stock tanked. And was there anything that piqued your interest in the earnings, calls, or questions from shareholders? Thanks for keeping me entertained while I work. Well, you're quite welcome, and thank you for submitting the question. Um, you know, I don't follow these earnings reports as closely as I used to. I don't own any AMD stock, so it's depending on my workload if I get to listen to it or look into it. There's always some interesting tidbits there. Like I would say the biggest interesting tidbit, both from this and the other earnings that have just come out, is that AMD lost some CPU market share despite selling millions of chips. That's how bad demand is that Intel just de facto sold them, even just because people may do with Intel, you know? So... <laughs> Go on. And I mean, after ga- after the whole GameStop debacle, do we really need to talk about how stock doesn't reflect reality? Like this is earning calls, depending on the company, if they don't exceed expectation, even though that's the speculation you're supposed to be buying the stock on. Uh, if they don't exceed that expectation, some companies are just going to go down in value because people are speculating on the speculation. So I, right. I don't know. Right. And I wrote down a note here that when you look at earnings calls, and I did own AMD stock, like, I mean, I sold it, I think, early 2020. Uh, That sounds right. Yeah. You know, all of it just uh, for two reasons. One, I had this suspicion in February that Corona was going to get pretty bad. Um, And also that I was just like, well, you know what? Maybe there's more profit to be made, but I, I, I just want to be able to say I'm objective. I mean, I'm not letting it, uh, you know, affect my decisions, right? And my analysis, uh, right? It's like, well, you own AMD stock. That's why you say good things. No, it's like, I buy AMD stock because I'm saying good things. Like I've yeah. come to this conclusion and you can see my arguments in my videos for why you should or shouldn't buy it, you know, but I don't own it anymore. Um, but one thing I learned when I did own it, you know, before I even made this channel, actually, is 
uh, it, the stock would just often go down because it's quite a hyped up stock. And so the stock price before earnings would often be assuming there's going to be a blowout above earnings. And oftentimes, actually, usually AMD would just slightly exceed earnings, but it wasn't a blowout. Surprise. So people would sell stock because it didn't meet their expectations. It's kind of funny how the stock price reflects the uh, <laughs> the anger gamers have about performance. Their performance over their cards all the time too it's just uh, for some yeah. reason amd is one of those companies where people are just constantly hoping they'll double expectations for some reason right and they continue to hope that will happen every time we're at the same time downplaying that what they have coming is impressive so there's that's what was so interesting about owning owning amd stock is it was like you're always balancing, well, no, they're not going to quadruple performance. But then the other camps are like, they're not even going to be 50% better, and then they would be wrong. So that's why it was interesting to own that stock. Yeah. Yoda King writes in and says, Hey, Tom, with Starlink now taking pre-orders for their services, what do you think about the future of the internet with Starlink and its competitors being more and more of a reality? I actually don't know like almost anything about Starlink. I guys again, I'm managing my own website and a podcast and videos and uh, I don't but did you follow this at all Dan? Um right as of right now, they, I think it's in beta. Uh it has it has around 40 millisecond lag uh latency and 50 to 150 megabit uh up uh speeds. So I don't know. It's okay if you live in a, an underserved internet area. And I think that's what it's trying to do. Hopefully, it can get to a point where it actually serves as a competitor to those pseudo monopolies that <laughs> exist all around the country. Something's got to happen. What 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 was the uh, what was the speed again? Uh, they they said expect speeds of like fifty to one hundred fifty megabit, which isn't bad. No, that's good. And I know um, I remember in college, uh, you know, I went to Michigan Tech, you know. I'm from a more populated area. My roommate was from a more rural area. And I remember we were watching SNL and I said, well, that's kind of cool. That satellite dish that can give you internet no matter where you are. And he go, it just looks at me and goes, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Why? He's like, I live in a remote area. It sucks. It's terrible. You'd almost rather not have internet. It's so unreliable. So this sounds significantly better than that. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I think that's all it's going to serve for the time being. What was the pre-orders? What is, what's the cost? Um, I didn't actually see what the cost of it was. I think they're, I think it's, they're advertising that it is 10, like 10% cheaper per megabit per second than other services though. No, so, so not still not going yeah. insane. Well, cause I know Comcast, right? Charge is like whatever, 50, depending on the area you're in. Of course, it's a monopoly, usually 50 to a hundred dollars for like, I don't know, 300 megabit per second you know it's cheaper in some places but but then they'll always have that like 25 megabit per second tier where they charge like half as much for like a sixth the speed so if they could make something close to whatever they're charging for that 25 megabit which let's be clear they're just throttling the speed needlessly they could probably give you 50 with almost no cost to themselves oh, like yeah. this would be a nice way of making those prices come back down to ground which if this got almost free 150 is enough that's good. It's enough for most people. And I think a lot of people would be like, oh, like it, like just if they could sp uh, spend, say, $20 a month on internet, like, oh, yeah, I'll take an eighth the speed to <laughs> spend <laughs> like 5% of what you have to pay for internet in some parts of the country. Yeah. All right. So let us move on to Job. He says, Tom, I'm listening to the latest die shrink. I would like to encourage you and Dan to check out Destiny 2. It is the best feel of any shooter I played on a controller. Keyboard and mouse feels great too. The story is fantasy sci-fi. Well, I played the first Destiny in Alpha and I was like, yeah, these controls are awesome. I mean, it's made by Bungie, so they know what they're doing. Um, the guns are fun, especially the exotic guns. Well, so here's the thing. Um, I know Destiny. We have a good friend who plays it a lot, but it's just at a certain point, we kind of pick our co-op game that requires a lot of time. And I, I'm not saying I wouldn't play it. I'm just saying, and I am saying I have played it and liked it, but it's like ours is kind of Borderlands. And Destiny, it just kind of feels inaccessible at this point. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I just don't see myself ever getting into it, honestly. And that's not to say it's bad because I, 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 a lot of people play it a ton. So it's clearly not a bad game. 
I mean, me and you play Battlefield and Borderlands for hundreds of hours. We've like grinded and gotten the best gear in Borderlands. And it's just, it's kind of our game, you yeah. know, with raid bosses. You know, I can't play all of them because they're like a thousand hours to like master. But it is to say, it's not, like, and, and we like the division two a lot as well. Although eventually we just kind of felt like we were done. Yeah. The, uh, the division two. I don't think it's I, end game was as good as other end games. No. And it seems like um, de- with destiny, they're trying to keep it a like refresh more. the content a lot more than what destiny does. And not destiny, than, what, oh, than yeah. the division. I mean, yeah, which I will say this though, I highly recommend the division too to anyone. You know, it's not even really a cost factor anymore. It's, I think it's been free a few times, if not almost free, probably both. Um, and it is worth playing through the campaign though. Like that is, it's better than the first one. And it's like each each mission was really fun. There's just only so many missions, and the late game wasn't as good. But just playing it purely yeah. as a fun game, even just single player or as co op. I highly recommend Division 2, but uh, yeah. I mean, Destiny seems to have much longer legs. Yeah. All right. Seawolf writes in and says, I'm sorry I missed the mail for the gaming episode. I'm interested in your opinion on mapping as it is related to gaming. I've been playing console and PC since the early 90s, and I've found regardless of platform or type of game, even ignoring things like glitches, lag, hit detection, and odd physics. I'm looking at you, Battlefield series. Great map creation can often overcome other defects. Making great maps pushes players towards fun and challenging interactions with other players, multi or co-op, and in single player against AI. I mean, absolutely, right? A game that comes to mind is SOCOM had fantastic maps. Just absolutely absurdly good maps. Yeah, and I never got into that really, but I, I feel like a lot of um a lot of the downfall of like co- what Call of Duty had for like a few years. More I mean, than a few years, well, I guess. But- yeah, I, for me though, I, I just, a drop in popularity. I, I think the map, yeah, I, downfall isn't the right way to say it. I, I should say, like for me, like losing interest in Call of Duty was a lot of it was the maps just got really uncreative, and they all just kind of became a variation on like one of two concepts of a map, like a big circle or two sniping spots, and that those are every map in like Call of Duty Modern Warfare too. <laughs> yeah, um, and. You know, it's funny, the current Modern Warfare we play has a bunch of the maps from the original Call of Duty 4, and maybe some of it's nostalgia, I don't know. But when I play it, I go, I don't know, man, Crash and Backlot are still great frickin' maps. Like, yeah. they're so much better than what's in. And I think Modern Warfare, the new one, has some good newer maps that we've played. None of them are bad. Like, I honestly felt Modern Warfare 3... And even twos, to a certain extent, maps were just terrible. And like and some of the other ones too are just bad maps. But I, 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 you know, so it's not like I'm saying modern warfare's the current modern warfare's maps are bad. But I still feel like it just feels like there is more thought put into making an interesting flow to the older some of the older maps. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of uh, yeah. It, you're right. Um, and I agree. Good good map design is essential to a game, even if. Even if there's bad hit detection, I mean, frankly, every game has had pretty bad hit detection up until relatively recently. Like if you're if you're firing an automatic gun in a game, a, a lot of games, it's like one out of three bullets hit. Yeah, and you just don't notice it because you sprayed a hundred bullets at them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, it's it, we could do a whole die shrink on this. I think there's just a lot less heart put into some of the maps that are out there now. Not in all games. Some games clearly go for it, and there's still great game design all over the place. But it just feels like, I don't know, like I, like even like Killzone, like Killzone Two. Those maps were like incredibly good. I just feel like Shadowfall specifically just kind of phoned in some of them. They did. I mean, I still had a lot of fun with Shadowfall, but. Yeah. The actual <laughs> mechanics itself were excellent, yeah. And and I'm trying to think of other games that do this. I wouldn't say Battlefield's ever phoned in maps, but I got to say, like, yeah, I don't know. Battlefield 4's maps were just unparalleled good in Battlefield 3's. And they were really uh, diverse, too. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think this is something to be talked about as well, where, yeah, I mean, if if you just put a lot of thought into the design of the map, like, it can... I mean, it can make the whole thing just so much more fun. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have much else to say. I thought that'd be a fun reader mail to end on. I did 
see one from Dr. Guns for Hands about GameStop stock and the problems with that. I don't want to say that I've ignored that. I think I'll just put that into the mailbag since this episode's going about as long as you want it to. We're not ignoring you, Dr. Guns for Hands. We'll get to it in a die shrink soon. Otherwise, I don't know, Dan, any last words? No, I don't think so. I think we talked enough today. (laughs) Again, the last thing I will say is this. You know, the RSS feed numbers, if you aggregate them, are going up. So we know so many of you listen to this audio only. There aren't a lot of ads in this, guys. And it's I've turned down a few sponsorships. 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 God, I'm falling asleep. A couple days ago, just because I just... They were basically just asking me to turn the first five minutes into an ad for a new web browser or something. And I'm not going to lie about it if I use it or not. So just appreciate that the only way podcasts ever really anymore function is if you support us. If even, again, if 10% of the people that watch even two pieces of Moore's Law's Dead content a week for free became $2 members, that's it. We could hire as many people as we want and not have to worry, really not have to worry about anything. Right. Yeah. Like so much of our, my effort sometimes just goes into, ah, I got to talk to this guy about an ad deal. Cause if I don't, I can't pay Gerard, you know, like just please support us. And also I added a new tier for advertising for like small businesses. So, you know, there's a tier there where if you want all of the extra content and you want to have something that is advertising, we'll put in like, you know, a 30 second ad read four times a week for a pretty low price, uh, you know, I'm part of the podcast as well. So just throwing that out there as well, if you want to. And I've also, you know, if we if we hit the next Patreon goal, guys, we'll, tell us what you want us to do. You know, we'll do something special. We'll give Reese a big bone at the very least. Well, she, Reese always deserves a big bone. How so. about this, Dan? If we get, if we, if you guys can just get us to the next Patreon, we will have a picture of Reese with a bone and Dan's dog holding a giant bone. We will use some of the proceeds to get both of our dogs giant bones, and we will give you adorable pictures of them. That's a pretty big deal, really. (laughs) All right. I think that's enough then. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, Thanks for those who do support us. Thanks for those who share our content. You know, even, even our free feed listeners, we really do appreciate you as well. Please continue to share us. That helps a lot as well. And uh, yeah, have a good evening, morning, afternoon. Blow Glark if you're on Arglar 7, whatever. Huge what, listenership on Arglar 7. A huge listenership on Arglar 7. Actually, our, our number one area is apparently like Hollywood and then Chicago. Hell yeah. <laughs> All right. Enough, enough. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. The following podcast was brought to you by the YouTube channel and website, Moore's Law is Dead. Moore's Law is Dead and Broken Silicon are trademarks of their creator, Tom. That guy is me, and I am indeed the creator, editor, writer, and showrunner of Moore's Law is Dead podcast, videos, articles, and other media. However, Moore's Law is Dead is a team with Broken Silicon co-hosted by my brother, Dan, audio editing by Gerard Cortez, and select technical editing by Carbon Cry. You can find all of our information, including how to get a hold of us, at www.moreslawsdead.com. And if you are a fan and would like to send mail or other hardware, please mail parcels to Moore's Law is Dead, P.O. Box 10468, Peoria, Illinois, 61612. And speaking of fans, without exaggeration, the patrons are responsible for the continued distribution of the content you just listened to. And so if you have some extra money, but only if you do, please consider supporting us. For just $2 a month, you get access to the exclusive podcast, Die Shrink, voting on subjects of future podcast episodes, the ability to have your questions read aloud on Broken Silicon, Die Shrink, and Loose Ends, and of course, the Moore's Law is Dead Discord full of like-minded people who would love to meet you. I am one of them. And at higher tiers, you get access to ad-free episodes of Broken Silicon, the back catalog of Flyover States podcast, thanks in the credits of videos and podcasts and other perks as well. And if you cannot afford to support us, please just share Moore's Laws Dead videos and podcasts with friends and family on social media and Reddit. And give Broken Silicon and Flyover States a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. All of this really does help so much more than I think anyone realizes. If you'd like to advertise on the podcast or a person of interest who would like to be a guest, please reach out to the email address mlhbdead at gmail.com. But as I said, this podcast would not be possible without its fans supporting it. And so now it is time to give a personal thanks to the greatest of the fans. The following supporters are at the 10 gigahertz or higher producer levels. 
Matthew McMullen, Telos, GUK, Benny Berlin, Justin Yant, Thomas Rupp, I love you, Lynn Jim, Tyvin K, Tom Bailey, Muhammad Akwari, Frederick Lau, James Crasser, Justin Parrish, Zachary Martin, Terrence Hare, Brad Medlin, Phil S, Bernie Elliott, The Ninth Dude, Greg Gregard, Josh Law, JBG, Travis Gooding, The Mechanical Philosopher, Lebo King Kilo, Fatboy DeSaru, Daniel Hyde, Burke Garcia, Tara Reed, Jack O'Neill, Matt Sale, Marin Close, Juan Garcia, Sean Balmer, My Name Is Nobody, Robert, Elethros, Telos, Hey There's a Kitty, Greg T. Wanchuk, Ivan214, John Jameson, Benjamin Cannon, Matthew Lane, Divider Samuel, Jan Rauner, Rubber Duck, Street of Full, Allie Robertson, Eric Jackson, Jonathan, Patrick Grow, Evan Dingle, Dominique Cox, Stefan, Original Ross, Hardforum.com, Sam MacArthur, Total Silo, Soul Connor, Michael Costa, Andrew S. Blake, Aaron Keith, Kerry Baldino, Endless Loggins, Tom San Filippo. Justice Brennan, Vi- Keen R, Trevor Powers, Stu, Elenia, Nanyan, Daniel Nishball, Franco Frederick, Hardware Numbers, Alex Carastillo, Dark Rain 2049, Leighton Perry, Joseph Kierman, Carlos Faldas, Carnivore Bear, Luca, Zabers Ivers, Zlicky, Man Porsche, David Cowden, Ricky Tan, Granadin, Patrick J.S., Justin Staples, Freddie Canos Jr., Christopher Foster, Kiwi Phil, Da Who Who, Sarah Light, Anthony Gareffa, Matthew Griffin, Alex, Joseph Loria, Luis Correa, Deke, Cheesy Ramen, Raul Ebeneni, Tim Robbins, Jake Dew23, Brian Riggleman, Chris Williams, Ryan Deniscu, Dave McCoy, Valko Malev, Gabe Langner, Paul B., Morton Spence, and Andrew, Thomas Summers, Maurice Courtois, Matthew J. Link, Scott Riff Schneider, Mai Sharona, Aaron, Roman, Jacob Stankiewicz, Jack Pym, Wakir Khan, Ashil Dar Epstein, Stephen Hart, Christopher A. Butler, Greg, Peter Moore, Chris Lakata, Justin Thomas, Sam Miller, James Kitchens, Kevin Chen, Shakir, Nick Rakin. Holden Mobley, Matthew Lazier, Arpit Sharma, Eden Pork, Jimmy NG, and Mads. And of course, thank you to Sahara for the music. 